Kathy will now call the roll. Councilmember Humbert. Here. Councilmember Holmstrom. Here. Councilmember Lewis. Here. Councilmember Storm. Here. Councilmember Sandler. Here. Councilmember Durkin. She's not able to be here. She has a cake in her neck. Um, she didn't say that Gail was causing pain in her neck. <laughs> she was just trying yeah. to be nice. Okay, so Eva's excuse? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'd just like to welcome everyone uh, who's chosen to be with us tonight. Our uh, citizens, uh, distinguished member of the media, um, representative from the port, and uh, our city staff. Thank you for being here. You are all a, a very important part of our decision-making process, so thank you. Um, Kathy has put out uh, a clipboard for you to sign if you're here. And those of you who are intending to address the council tonight, there's another clipboard up here for you to uh, sign up, indicate what topic you'll be speaking to. Um, when, when we come to that point of the meeting, uh, we'll go down the list in the order of the people who signed up. If there's anyone who'd like to sign up now, we can pass that over. Okay, uh, on with the agenda. Uh, first item on our agenda tonight are additions or amendments to the agenda. Uh, Paul, as the custodian of our agenda, did you have any additions? I have no additional items, Mayor. Okay. Members of the council, anything you'd like to suggest? Okay. I also have none. Uh, next item on the agenda is the adoption of the consent agenda. Uh, it could be approved in, uh, in its entirety in a single motion. Uh, these are routine items. A councilor that wants to remove an item may do so. So the consent agenda is approval of the minutes of November 14th, 2011 council meeting, approval of the minutes of November 21st, 2011 council meeting, ratification of the bills in the amount of $172,957.36, and the approval of an amount not to exceed $7,600 to Munson Paving LLC for paving in Win Winsong Terrace subdivision. I'll move for approval of the consent agenda. Motion by Randy Holmstrom. Is there a second? I'll make a second. Second by Jeff Helfrich. Any discussion? Uh, I need to abstain because I live in Winsong. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Seeing none, I'll uh, move to a vote. All those in favor of the consent agenda. Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. The okay, next item on the agenda uh, is the public hearings. Uh, we do not have any this evening. And so we'll move to our action items. Uh, we'll proceed with these action items in order. Uh, first with a staff report, then any citizen questions, if there's, uh, if there's people that have signed up, and then council action with a motion in a second. So the first item uh, on our agenda for action items is to adopt the fire report. Mr. Cook, do you have? Yes, Honorable Mayor and members of City Council, you have before you uh, for a second time, my final report and recommendations dealing with the Emergency Services Department. We reviewed this at the work session uh, you've had copies uh, of it available to you, and uh, you have a number of options here. What I'm recommending that you do tonight is to adopt the report as submitted and authorize the creation of a City Council subcommittee on public safety to assist us in providing oversight in the rebuilding process for the department, and then creating a public safety task force composed of appointed citizens to hold community meetings, uh, help determine the type of emergency services department you desire, uh, determine cost, funding, and how you want to deliver that service, uh, and then that, that task force uh, have 90 days to get its work done. This is the group, uh, as we went through the recent uh, issues with the, the emergency service department, where the uh, Fire Chiefs Association, CIS, insurance company, and the Special Districts Association of Oregon have all agreed to provide resources to help this group help you get a handle on what do we want, how are we going to pay for it, and how are we going to deliver it. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cook. We did 
not have uh, anyone sign up uh, for citizen questions. Last chance. Okay. Um, so uh, the next action would be for the council to um, we'd, have, we'd have a motion and a second um, to adopt the fire report. All motion we adopt the fire report. It's been moved by Randy Holcomb to adopt the fire report. Is there a second? Second. Mark Storm has seconded. Okay, council discussion. Was there a question? Well, there's, I, there's a question. Well, we've had a question on um, how the committees will work. There's in that report. There's two, two different committees. Correct. That is correct. Um, I guess uh, we, we were kind of kicking around how we, how we wanted, to, how we wanted to do that. Are we still kicking that, that around? How we, how we want to do those committees? You had one committee that was a, 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 a fairly small committee, and then the second committee was a fairly was a large committee. Yeah, there, there are two committees recommended. Mm -hmm. One would be a working subcommittee of this council who would be assigned the topical area of public safety. The first priority would be working with Chief Wells and I on rebuilding the fire department, helping us develop the policies and procedures, and then that would give you three members of the council who would participate in that and could begin to give that some of the, the council flavor. I see that as an ongoing standing committee because your issues are not going to disappear. Uh, they're always going to be there. And it's not unusual for city councils to have working subcommittees. The second committee is, is the one that deals with the long range solutions to your emergency service issue. And I'm suggesting, and you have a council member who disagrees with me, and I think that is great, that you have up to 15 people that you appoint through, your, through the same process that you used uh, to select new members of the city council. In other words, I think it's very important that you make people apply, that you interview them, and then you select people who will do the best job for the community, and then let them take 90 days and figure out what's, what's the level of service, what is that going to cost, how do we pay for it, how you to deliver it. Uh, I'd just like to clarify the point of disagreement. So it's not <laughs> misunderstood. I don't disagree with community involvement, citizen participation. The only point I disagreed with was whether there were 15 members or five. So I just, I just want to clarify that. Any interest in splitting the difference? Pardon? Any interest in splitting the difference? Uh, that's the only opinion I'm going to make tonight. <laughs> well, I've been told I talk too much, so. Who told you that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I want to clarify, so, so, so we understand. I think there's still a lot of interest in the community that we have uh, town hall type meetings where we have a, an open and public discussion um, of the long term. Um, solutions for our fire department. Now, I just want to make it clear that uh, I look at this task force as a way to do that. It's going to give us some structure to the discussion. Uh, there's going to be a, 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 clear, um, a clear charge to the committee, some specific things we'd like, questions we'd like to have answered. Um, and, and this is a way that, that we can involve more and more people in the community. Everyone would like to be a part of it. Um, so even if it's someone that didn't want to apply and go through that process, they could still attend every meeting of the task force uh, and share their input at that time. Um, so I think this is, a, this, is, this is something that's necessary as part of um, being an open and participatory democracy. So we need this. And I think it's, it's a good idea to get this started soon. Um, I don't think that uh, by adopting the fire report, we are automatically starting that ball rolling. There's going to be further action we need to take. But I think that's necessary action. So that's sort of to address what, what you were saying. I don't think that because we adopt this fire report that we're saying we're going to do these committees with 15 and not 5 or with a subcommittee of the council and not the whole council or anything like that. 
those are just the recommendations in it. So I want to make that clear so that, that, that everyone understands those are, that's the direction we're going, but we haven't adopted that particular strategy. So. But it seems to me that if we adopt the report, that's what we're adopting is, is that. Because if we are, <clears throat> if we're going to change that part of the report around after we adopt it, then, then, then there's other parts of the report that we would change around as we, <coughs> as we adopt it. It seems, seems to me once we adopt this thing, that's, the, that's the, the thing we're going by. So we should probably, it seems to me, we should have locked in the, the recommendations of that report. If we're going with those recommendations, then we're going to follow those recommendations. So if we want to change parts of that report, we should, it seems to me we should change it before we adopt the, before we adopt the report. You could adopt the report and do nothing. Uh, cities do this all the time. But what I'm asking you to do is to adopt the report. And if you'll notice, there were some issues in the short-term strategies that we've already had you act separately. The contract with City of Hood River uh, for those two services. Those are separate. This is, a, this is an important enough issue that I'm trying to break this apart. So it's okay with me if you adopt the report and do nothing, but I think you want to solve those problems. And that's why I pulled out the council subcommittee concept as well as the citizen task force concept. So, so okay. I, I, I get would it. you be okay then if, yeah. we come, if we come back in a different meeting with an action item that says the creation of the task force? Well, or creation of the subcommittee, or if it's going to be a subcommittee. No, I understand what they're what they're coming from. There, we're just basically adopting a report. We're not adapting an act. We're not adopting an action an action thing. We're just saying we accept the the report, and obviously we can change what we need to on the report as we as we get into it, or things we want to do on the report. Yeah, I'm good with that. Other discussion from the council. Uh, hearing no more discussion, we'll move to a vote. Those who are in favor of the motion, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same signal. Abstentions, motion passes. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the cancellation of the December 26, 2011 City Council meeting. Mr. Kirk, do you have a report on that? Right, and I'm going to pass this off to Kathy to give this report. Uh, just to let Council know, the 26th will be the second meeting in December, and uh, the last several years, uh, Council has canceled the second meeting in December. Uh, some people on vacation uh, with family or whatever. So we're just asking, if you want to cancel that meeting, we can always reschedule to a different date. So we make that decision tonight. And the 26th. Uh, so to move on this, we need a motion uh, to cancel the meeting and second, Mark. I'll make a motion to uh, cancel the second meeting, uh, December 26th. There's a motion by Mark Storm. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. Second in the motion. Uh, any council discussion? Dale. So are we canceling to only have one meeting in December without rescheduling in January? So we're just canceling a meeting all together. Well, we, we currently have December 5th, December 12th, and December 19th already scheduled okay, for December. I didn't have to. But this would be, I don't, think we, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to have a, no. a meeting without the staff. So if we're going to have the fourth meeting in December, we need to move it to a different no, but we already have three meetings in December. Yes, okay, that's correct. That's what I want. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, other discussion? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor uh, of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Next item on our agenda is to set the City Council priorities. Mr. Cook, do you have a staff report? I do. Uh, honorable Mayor, members of City Council, I included in the staff report a couple of 
pieces of background information for you. One is the initial set of council priorities established on September 12th by the previous council. And then you also have a copy of the uh, enhanced list of work plan items. So you can begin to see once the council adopts a um, priority, how the work plan fits in. The work plan gets into much more detail. So once uh, the council says, this is what we want you to do, then I come back and say, here's how we're gonna do it, here's who's gonna do it, here's when it'll be done by, and here's how you can measure success. So you have that piece. You also have in the packet uh, the city council priorities in a grouped format. So what I did is uh, took the existing priorities that came off of the newsprint exercise we did with the previous council. They adopted those, how many were there? Those 21 priorities. And then I took those and grouped them slightly differently than they showed up in that laundry list. So you ended up with seven and the categories I created were first priority was resolving the issues surrounding the conflict in the fire department. Second was finance and you'll see all of the items that I picked off the laundry list that I thought fit in there. Third was economic development, same approach. And then communicate and rebuild community trust shows as a zero and that wasn't exactly the way that the council had identified it. Uh, and then five is enhanced infrastructure, not exactly the way it was identified before. Hire a new city administrator is six, and then seven were organizational development. Those things that we need to do in-house uh, to, to make the organization more effective and enhance its capability. That's what I have, and we have some we have some mini dots here tonight, so if you wanted to go through the dot exercise, we could do that. Or you could adopt these grouped priorities as presented, or anything else that you would want to do with this. I would point out too, Mayor, remember that your priorities and then the following work plan actually become parts of uh, my contract. And so when you adopt a priority, I do a work plan and bring it back for you to approve. So is your intent tonight then that, uh, that within each of these group priorities, we adjust uh, the priority from, you know, you have a list of my letter, A to I, A to A, H, or is your intent that, um, and, and then go through the dot exercise to establish those priorities? Or is your intent that we um, <coughs> look at the title of the group? So the first one is resolve issues surrounding the current conflict, the next one is finance, the next one is economic development. And then make sure that the way they're listed are those priorities. Then each letter item becomes part of a work plan. Yeah, you actually could do it either way, Mayor. Okay. <clears throat> and we could quickly make the list of each of these, or you could adopt them as presented, or you could uh, send them back for reworking in a different format, or you could just, uh, within the seven categories, set priorities within those seven. Some of them, once you get into the detail, when you look at, let's say, organizational development, for example, <coughs> Um, some of those items A, B, and C may or may not get done in a reasonable work year given some of the big issues that we're facing as a community. They are things that need to be done eventually. So I'm just, I, I'd like to hear what your recommendation is for how to proceed with, set, with this, this item of setting city council priorities. Well, my recommendations are to review and discuss the current list of priorities and issues, and that's the uh, 21 items that came off of the newsprint, and then add or delete or change those priorities depending on your desire, and then if you, if you want to use the sticky dot process to recast those, we actually could use those existing 
uh, newsprint sheets give you some dots and you could recast those priorities. Uh, and then, then if you agree on those priorities, adopt those and then uh, by motion move on. Okay. So I don't think there's a real clear motion for the council to make on this, but we do need to talk about uh, how we want to set these priorities. We want to work off of this list with different dots. We want to work <coughs> with the, the group priorities list and establish uh, categories and priorities. Or how do we want to proceed? Yeah. I think the grouping uh, kind of makes more sense than you have the subcategories within that. And then what they're able to come up with as a priority and work towards is an easier goal for staff than trying to list the 21 or 29 or 30 items per uh, uh, occurrence that's going on. I think that, that idea is a better, a better way to go, more workable plan for them. I, I, I agree with that. I, agree that. I, I, I like the idea that they've taken the economics, the different things we have in here, and got a group plans, kind of grouped into, into those priorities. And from that, you can you can work your priorities. Those specific priorities come to the top from there. Okay. Is there yeah. anyone that? Oh, sorry. Uh -oh. Is there anyone that disagrees with the idea of working off of the group lists? Okay. So. Jeff, then back to you. Is your idea then that within each group we would arrange uh, items by priority? Yes. And do that right now? Yes, we can, I think we can do that. I know okay. it's up to well, the other council members, but from looking at it, you know, re redoing the wheel isn't really necessary. I think it's just a few little tweaks within the subcategories that uh, do well for this council. Is there anyone that objects to that idea? Yeah. I, well, I don't know if I object, but one, I don't have a problem with the, the group concept and the priorities, but I'd just soon not take the time tonight to play dot to dot when we've got, you know, other issues to discuss and a presentation and other people. I think it's more of a workshop item. We've got one person saying we'd like to get these this resolved tonight. We've got one person saying let's postpone it to a workshop. Um, any other input on that? Mark? Yeah, I'd like to get it done tonight. Okay. Uh, how do we feel about the idea of postponing this agenda item to the end of the meeting or at least after the presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the appearance of interested citizens to share a variety of perspectives on issues facing our community. Um, and uh, right now, these are going to be comments on matters not on the agenda. Um, first up, Darla Davis uh, talking about the Festival of Lights. Huh? Right here. Hello, I'm Darla Davis. I'm the current president of the Lioness, Columbia Gorge Lioness, and we sponsor the Festival of Lights. This is our eighth year, and it's coming up this Sunday already. Can you believe it? The holiday season is starting. We'd like everyone to come out to City Hall from 4.30 to 6.30 on Sunday. If you like, you can bring a dozen cookies to donate for everyone to share. We'll have, um, the kids will have a craft where they can make um, tr uh, Christmas tree ornaments, sorry. They'll be able to get their picture taken with Santa. And um, we'll have a sing-along and coffee and cookies and juice. And so it's been a really great event. It was originally started with um, Joanne Wittenberg's idea and Susie Lilligard, and we started down at the old fire hall, and it's gotten progressively bigger and bigger. 
we'll have uh, live music with Christmas carol sing-alongs. And then at the very end of the evening, we light the Christmas tree. And as one of our members like to say, we get to go, ooh, ah, the <laughs> lights are beautiful. And we're very thankful for everyone who participates. We have great community support from many different groups. And we especially would like to thank the Public Works Department. They do all the putting up of the Christmas lights and helping us flip the switches that night and stuff. So thank you, and I hope everyone can come out and join us. What were the times again? Uh, 4 30 to 6 30. And once again, I, I want to say that um, Santa's pictures will be downstairs <coughs> in the small conference room, and the crafts will be up here in this room. So it's a little different than we've done it in the past. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Doris. Thank you. Okay, appearing next for the council is Joanne Wittenberg to talk about a calendar. Um, when we were at the last community action team meeting, Jean McLean had a wonderful idea about making a community calendar because we no longer have our quarterly newsletter that the city uh, puts out. So um, I said to Jean, I'll help you. And then um, we came and talked with Mr. Cook and um, uh, Kayla Karen helped format this and, uh, and printed it. And this copy will go out with your electric bill that comes in the mail on the first of the month. And on the front of it, it's a very simple calendar. We want it to come out every month. Um, it's the front part is just the meetings are just stated any you know public meeting is stated and then on the back side there is a small narrative or a contact person so if people have more uh, interest in what time this happens or you know what what's part of this um, they can um, call that person and find out more information about that meeting um, right now, the calendar has a mistake already on it because you've just canceled the 26th meeting. <laughs> but I didn't want to take it off the calendar because you hadn't had your vote yet. So uh, it's on there, and um, that's, already, uh, that's already a mistake. But that's okay. Um, we're starting simple, and we hope it's a success, and, um, and it can go in the same envelope. And they've already been printed and folded, and... Uh, they're ready to go. When you're when you get your electric bill, you'll get another one. And I thank the city for helping us with the printing of this. It's a good idea. Thank you. Uh, that's all we had to sign up for um, this section of the agenda. So we'll move on to our reports and presentations. And we'll start with Chief Wells' uh, report on the status of the plan to rebuild Mayor and members of council, as you will recall, uh, we had recommended to you and you did approve a contract with the city of Hood River to acquire the services of Chief Wells and some members of his department to help us <coughs> in the process of rebuilding your emergency services department. We've had a number of meetings uh, and Chief Wells is here tonight to begin to talk to you about the organizational format uh, that uh, we're leaning toward in that process. Devin, take it away. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Your Honor and members of the Council, thanks uh, for the opportunity to come tonight and present this to you. And I also thanks for the opportunity to work with uh, Paul and uh, Acting Chief uh, Zerfing and the volunteers at, at the Cassie Locks Department. It's, it's an opportunity to, to rebuild the department and getting, getting public safety back going in this community. So uh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for it. Um, tonight, I just want to go over uh, briefly the uh, a format that I recommend that the department be placed into to spread out the responsibilities. So uh, previously, you had a, a full-time paid fire chief here, and, and when that happens, when you have one, one paid fire chief and an all the volunteer department that's a small department, that paid person ends up doing the vast majority of the work, 90-95% of the work in the department. They do all the maintenance, they do the training records. They do all the administrative work, they do the operations, they do everything because they're, they're there, 40 hours or plus a week. Um, with the absence of a full-time paid staff in the department, um, those responsibilities still have to happen. Fire departments don't just stop existing when you don't have a paid staff, you have a volunteer department, and you still have to uh, assign all those tasks. Well, instead of assigning one volunteer the task of, of being 
uh, doing the same work that a paid person does, but having to do it in their off time and away from their family time and everything else that a volunteer commits to, to the fire department, um, you spread that workload out. And so the proposal tonight is that we would establish uh, five main officer positions. <coughs> and uh, the, the, the areas, I broke them into areas, not necessarily, um, there, there's no ranks attached to them. Uh, we, that, that'll, that'll come. We'll, we'll figure that out as we get down the road here. But uh, the first position that would be is an administrative officer. And the administrative officer would be someone that is responsible for processing POs, uh, purchase orders, keeping records of the department, uh, doing the reports, uh, certain reports for council, council reports, mayor reports. Uh, it would be city hall's contact uh, with the administrator, um, standard operating procedures and guidelines, the whole administrative ball of wax that happens in the department. And uh, that's, that's a lot of work, uh, but that would be the, the one thing that that person has to focus on is just the administration and the contact with the city, city administration. Um, a second position that would be, would be suggested would be a logistics officer. And logistics is uh, responsible for keeping the department running. And, and, and logistics sounds like a boring job, and yeah, it's just someone sits on a desk and orders office supplies all day long, but that's not what a, it is part of a logistics officer's job, but uh, without a logistics officer, you don't have apparatus maintenance, you don't have facility maintenance, you don't have the proper personal protective equipment being ordered and maintained. Uh, so this person will be responsible for all those things, miscellaneous support items, uh, food support, different things that would be supporting the fire department. Working with that person, I would, I would recommend at least three specialists, if you want to call that. Don't get too hung up on the officer and specialist. I didn't know what to call them without calling them chief, captain, lieutenant, corporal, whatever you want to call it in a rank system. So you would have a vehicle maintenance specialist would be one person you'd, I think you'd want to break out that would work underneath or work for or work with the logistics officer. Be directly responsible for maintenance of the vehicles. And you have uh, seven or nine, uh, so somewhere in there, rolling stock at the fire department. And that's, that's a lot of work to keep every one of those oil changes and making sure that they run smoothly. Uh, the time to find out that they don't run is <coughs> not when the phone goes out for an emergency incident. Uh, so maintaining those vehicles and keeping them operating in order is actually a, a lot of work. Uh, another specialist you'd have working with the logistics officer would be a radios or communication specialist. Making sure the radio system is up and running good, making sure pagers work, radios in the apparatus work, that would maintain that whole, uh, that whole scheme of things. And another person would be a uniforms and, and PPE specialist, someone that would be just dedicated to working with personal protective equipment. Uh, personal protective equipment is very expensive. Uh, turnouts with the clothes the firefighters wear uh, range from $1,800 to $2,500 per set. Uh, if you have 20 volunteers, that's pretty quick math, $40,000 worth of just the clothes that they wear uh, when they're fighting the fires. Uh, but there's a lot of auxiliary personal protective pieces of equipment that have to be used also. And, Having someone that inventories that and makes sure it's clean and working order and has a, a replacement plan in place so that you don't uh, wind up 10 years from now having to buy 25 new sets of turnouts, you buy them over a period of time so you don't, uh, you don't get slammed one time. That would be one person's job. So that's kind of a logistics section that would work with the, with the department. Um, the, next, uh, the next lead officer would be an operations officer. Of course, that sounds like the most glamorous role because it's operations and you're out there, you know, fighting fire. But the operations officer really is still administrative and they are the person that's responsible for the overall operations of the department, uh, making sure what guidelines we use for fighting fires. Do we ventilate fires? Do we not ventilate fires? Do we do exterior attack and then interior attack? The whole, the whole description of what you do as a fire department. It's a lot of work, uh, especially in a volunteer department because you never know how many you're going to get to show up. Sometimes you may show up with 15 firefighters on scene, and other times of the week you may show up with three firefighters on scene. You never know. Um, so that's a, that's a difficult position to be in, and it's a, someone that can work on plans to set those in place. And I would recommend having two specialists that work with the operations officer, one focusing on EMS, or emergency medical systems, and the other person working focusing on fire systems. So you'd have an EMS specialist and a fire specialist working underneath the operations guy. And both of those would obviously work directly, uh, would, would specifically focus on emergency medical work, making sure the ambulance is in, in operation correctly. Maybe this is the person that would be doing your quality assurance re reviews of your uh, medical reports to make sure that the, the reports are being written appropriately, one, for a from a legal standpoint, and two, for a billing standpoint. 
to make sure that you can bill appropriately for the call that you went on, making sure medical supplies are on the ambulance, that, that the drugs are accounted for appropriately, all things go along with medical. Same thing the fire person would do, just they would be doing it on the engines, not on the ambulances. So you split that out and, and assign people to those different positions. A uh, fourth position would be a training officer. A training officer runs the training program for the department. A very busy, it's a very busy uh, position. A lot of work to do, making your annual calendar, making sure that you hit all the annual, annual mandated requirements from OSHA and Oregon EMS and uh, all, all the other requirements that are out there, trying to meet as many National Fire Protection Association standards as possible. Um, so the, the training officer has a lot of record keeping to do and report writing to do. So you give that person also two positions that would assist them, an EMS training specialist and a fire training specialist. So the EMS training specialist would only have to have their brain focused and occupied on EMS medical training. So they can think of drills that you have to do and 80 to 95, 80, 80 to, excuse me, 85 to 90 percent of your calls you go on in Cassie Locks are medical related. So that's a, that's a big training component to make sure that we're up to, uh, up to snuff on our, on our training for medical. Same thing with the fire specialist to make sure that we can, and the other 10%, uh, even though that doesn't happen very often, the other 10% of calls tend to be your highest risk calls, and making sure that we operate smoothly on fire incidents. And then finally, the other main officer would be a safety officer. And this person wouldn't necessarily be the one that's dedicated to be safety officer on all emergency scenes. Um, it would be the safety officer that would res be responsible for uh, the upkeep and the safety uh, in the fire station, make sure the OSHA guidelines are being followed, uh, what guidelines we need to have, uh, any tripping hazards or any problem that they see. If they're on a training ground, they'd watch for safety issues there. Um, in a, in a d small volunteer department, you can't uh, have just one dedicated safety officer, but you have one that's responsible for the program because you never know if the person can show up on scene or not. So they'd be responsible for doing some safety training and get other people prepared to be safety officers on scene. So I know that's a lot of words and a lot of information. I should have had a nice chart and stuff here, but I didn't. Um, but the five positions that would, the main officer positions would be an administration officer, an operations officer, a logistics officer, a training officer, and a safety officer. Those would be the five main main positions with assistants and specialists that would support those positions to help it. And the main focus is to spread out the workload. And so people would be responsible uh, for doing certain parts and reporting back, and you'll have uh, probably to begin with bi-weekly, well, I don't know how, I don't know what word is, every two weeks, um, having meetings as an officer group just to make sure everybody's on board with that, and it'd probably taper down to, to one meeting a month to have officers meetings. So. That's the, that's the pitch, that's the kind of the idea that I have for an organizational uh, establishment for a small department like this. So, um, any questions about that? Mayor, before we have questions, I think it's important, Council, for you to keep in mind that if this sounds good to you and it makes sense, uh, Chief Wells and I will be working with Acting Chief Zerfing and we'll be putting some some meat on the, that broad framework, and as we make progress, we'll be coming back to you with progress reports to let you know how that's going to look. And, and sometimes those reports, I mean, we'll, we'll ultimately need to um, move up into the action item portion of our agenda. Right. So there will be action for us to take when we establish some of these, these guidelines. But initially, it's just it's feedback right now. Okay, Jeff? Chief Wells. Um, strange, it sounds familiar like an ICS model. It, it is very much like an ICS model. <laughs> with that, with that model that you talk about, and you had one person doing all these jobs. Mm -hmm. With your knowledge of what the department has for volunteers right now, are you able to implement that plan in place with the volunteers that are able uh, that we have there? Or how much more training would it take to have those volunteers be part of an ops officer or the sub specialist of that? And we have. We have the people, the volunteers in place to make, execute. I, I believe so. I, you know, if you look back eight months ago, you had a fully functioning fire department. Now you had a paid chief, sure, uh, but you also had officers underneath that chief that were taking care of responsibilities. So I, I believe that uh, going through and finding the right person for the right job and what their interests are, I, I totally feel that you'll be able to fill those spots. You know, the safety officer position, it'd be nice to have someone that's had incident safety officer training. Uh, they don't have to but they could. And so you put someone in that position that has a background of some safety work and kind of understands r rules and regulations, give them the training that they need to, to meet those standards. So 
So yeah, I think I think you you've got uh, you've got 13 uh, volunteers and seven seven more that are recruits. I think what it is. So you'll end up with 20 uh, firefighter uh, volunteers here at the end of the academy, which will be probably about May or June next year. So that's a pretty good size department. 20, 20 volunteers down here. So what you have outlined here, um, it leaves room for um, growth and uh, flexibility. And, and so um, with the people we have now, um, how long would it be before you know we can fully implement everything that's on this? How long would it take? Yeah, I, I don't have a specific time for you of, of how long it would be. Um, I, I plan to start, we, we plan to start, I should say we, are plan to start meeting with people here very shortly, probably this week if not next. Um, to get going on getting some of these at least lead officer positions filled up uh, so people can be taking responsibility for maintenance of the vehicles and training, make sure those things don't get dropped anymore. And so, I, you know, I can see that uh, by the end of the year, we could easily have the, the main officer areas filled and, and things starting to work and operate and, and easily within a few months have, have everything else filled up and ready to go. So, yeah. and, and, you know, there's a lot of the returning volunteers that are coming back filled these roles previously. And so it's just a matter of whether or not they're still interested in doing those same roles, or if they want to try something different, or where they want to go. It's it's really about having the having the volunteers buy into the department and and do something they like. Because if you're given an assignment that you don't like, obviously you're not going to put your heart and soul into it. Right. But if you say, you know, hey, I'd really like to do EMS. Well, great. There's Maybe quite a variety here too. There is. There's a lot of things for people to do. So. Yeah, um, I, I assume as we move through time. Potential for some expenses to be incurred, and I just I, I'm not sure which person is responsible for managing the overall finance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the city council here looks at the sure. whole thing as a department, not the categories of your officers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So one, be aware of that, and two, the more advanced we have of forecasting expenses, mm -hmm. the better chance. Yeah, very much so. We haven't even got into the budget discussion yet, uh, at least with my with my work here. But uh, I think uh, one of the best ways to do is to take the EMS EMS supplies person, EMS operations person. They would be responsible for that line item, and so they would be. Uh, we would sell them, hey, you've got two thousand dollars this year to spend on medical supplies. Use it wisely, and so they would they would then have to help. And I would help them develop a budget. Uh, the administrative officer would be the one that would be the person that the, all the POs would go through so they would be able to track them. And I don't know how the PO system works or how the, how the finance system works yet, but they would be the, the one gateway to the administration officer, not necessarily to, to approve or disapprove of the purchases, but to keep track of them and to make sure that the in-house budget is meeting the city's budget. So, yeah. That's correct. From the, That's correct. The fire right. Okay, is that going to continue under this plan? That will continue. Wait, you approve them before they're committed, correct? Uh, hopefully. Yes. Could before this before this topic closes, uh, Acting Chief Zerfing is here. Uh, Jess, is there any comments that you want to make uh, about where we're going? Uh, Jess has been actively involved as much as he can as a part-time fire chief for the community. 
Uh, but our intent, as I, we've indicated before, is the three of us will be interviewing people, determining who fills what slot. And then uh, at the last uh, council meeting, we talked about the provisional approach, and that's that from that, would, would we get 12? Mm -hmm. So we got 12 of the volunteers came out of that particular offer, and they have until December 1st to get all of their paperwork in. But that gave us the opportunity to get more people on board to be able to cover, get better coverage for the holiday and move us forward much quicker. So you went from the seven volunteers that Acting Chief Zerfing had recruited and was training uh, up to 20. Just thank you for the work you've been doing there to keep our department running. We appreciate it. Yeah, Dale, did you have one more? Just yeah. Uh, so, just for uh, clarification, how would you describe our coverage or responsive capabilities now? Is it fire only or uh, ALS ambulance or BLS ambulance? see the truck down uh, uh, towards Multnomah Falls and <coughs> I'm not sure what happened with the Multnomah County contract so it, you don't have to answer it tonight but it looks like we're not anticipating the money. But nothing's happened with the Multnomah County contract. I've been in contact with Multnomah County and keeping them up to speed as well as so is Paul. Um, we've been letting them know where we're at so they're, they're behind us, they're paying attention and all these things are going in the direction they are. They, they have no intentions of pulling our our contract. They don't Some want of the financial that. things said we weren't anticipating the $20,000. As far as I know, there's nothing changed with that. Okay. So the last one I talked to them about two, three weeks ago, um, they were just asking questions and they said they don't want to pull our contract because they think that we're the best suited to service that portion of Mullen County and they want to continue that service. So once we uh, you know, once we're completely up to speed, we're going to continue to give them that input, and I think we're making them feel pretty good at the moment. Yes. And, and Chief Zerfing is correct. I talked with the county today. <coughs> 
they, as soon as we can show them that we have that capability, I think you're going to start seeing the reimbursement for that come in. So Randy said that the, the fire engine was down at Multnomah, Multnomah Falls. Yeah. Is that good enough to show them? In the Dotson area. And I, oh, yeah. whatever. Well, what they, that's Multnomah County, though. What they want to know, what they, what they would want to have in perfect rule is 100% 24 hour a day coverage into their, their parts of the county. So the last I spoke to them, I was like, you know, we're really close to that. I don't know if we're 100% because of people's work schedules and, you know, as we get more people on board. So, so we're really close. 90, 80, 90% of the time, I think we'll be there. So it's, it's hard to predict that, just based off of people's work schedules and the availability and phone calls. Um, so. And a lot of it is going to be, again, it's going to rely on the work that Chief Wells does with this. So once we have a plan, this is the organizational structure, here's how it works, here's what we think the schedule is, we'll give that to the county and that, that will help, that will mean a lot to them, as it will for the rest of the mutual aid agreements. We have to have a plan in writing to go to the others. And if I'm wrong, Devin, mm -hmm. let me know. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you want as a council, if you want mutual aid agreements back, we have got to show on paper that we have the capabilities. And that's very true. And I think um, we're not very far off that Chiefs Association, uh, speaking on their behalf, I don't know if they want me to or not, but I'm going to. But the discussions I've had with them, um, it's been very open, very interested in seeing the response happen. And once Cassie Lark starts handling their calls, then their mutual aid uh, agreement will be restored very quickly. So and that's that's not very far away. I mean, they're, they're handling their calls uh, very well. So it's uh, that, that's, the, that's a close thing. I think when that gets restored, Scamini County EMS has already been restored. Uh, Scamini County Fire never was, uh, never went away. Um, once we show those three mutual aid agreements in full function again, I don't think Multnomah County will, will, will balk. I, I don't know the relationship at all, but uh, I can't imagine that they would have a problem with that. So, Jeff? Uh, Acting Chief Zirkin, you had mentioned that the ambulance wasn't able to <coughs> respond for uh, medical calls. Is that right? Um, you, had order, you had order supplies, order or something? No, no, we, we can respond to today. It's just at what level can we respond to that? Um, the paramedic level is where we're having a, a problem at the moment because we have some drugs that expired and we got to order those and get those here. So we're in the process of working <coughs> to get those here. At, by the end of the week, I would guess that those would be here. So I just got to <coughs> check on that and see where we're at. But I, I don't think that's going to be very far off before that's ALS level, the paramedic level is, is a whole. It's whole again. Um, but basic life support Plan for a, a person in the department to do the billing, you mean, or, or well, what? For the, for the calls we're, we're Just to make sure they're being them. billed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the way that works is that when you go on a call, the person, the only person that's in charge of the incident is the one that writes the report. And so that's that was the, the gap that wasn't happening, that was, that was being missed there for the last few months. The report gets written, and then that report gets printed off and forwarded to Mary Ann so she can get it down to Springfield, and Springfield does all the billing for you. And so we don't have to, Cassie Watson doesn't have to worry at all about doing the billing itself. You just make sure you get the appropriate work, paperwork, and, and report 
to Springfield. Springfield Fire and Life Safety will do the billing for it and collect and send the money back to you. So, but that that should be that shouldn't be a problem at all with this this is structure. So, so that's that's a routine part of the operation at the moment. Other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate the work you're putting in. Thank you, Mayor Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just have one quick uh, thing I'd like to say. Uh, my wife couldn't be here to say it, so I'm going to say it. Um, every year, uh, the uh, fire department has gone out and gone house to house and delivered uh, food. And I think that uh, they're planning to do that this year. And I wanted to see if we could get volunteers to help uh, pack the food and get, get it rolling for them and do anything we can to get the what they need and the city needs and uh, if, they, uh, if they need to do it, I mean if they want to get information or they, they can call here. I think, did you get the, uh, the date that that was going to happen? The food drive? Yeah. yeah. The food drive is happening this Thursday. Will be going out. It's coming Thursday. It's Thursday evening. Okay. So yes. it's going out. It's December 1st. Thank you, and thanks to our volunteers for helping organize that. <coughs> thanks. Good job. Thanks, Chief. Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is a report on options for the K-12 school in Cascade Locks. I know Mr. Cook, uh, you wrote the staff report for this, but we I also did. have a couple of other guests yes. uh, here to speak to that. So I'll turn that over. Mr. Mayor, members of the board, um, I know at least one or two of you, but for the rest of you, my name's Connie Kennedy Batasio, and I am the retired superintendent for the Nestucca Valley School District. So if you have been to um, Pacific City, uh, at the coast, Cloverdale, Beaver, Hebo, uh, all those big metropolitan places like that, Nesco and Sand Lake, <laughs> that was my district. And I was very proud to be there and enjoyed my opportunity to be their superintendent. Before I was their superintendent, I was the assistant superintendent at the Hood River County School District. And I left there to take the job at the coast. Um, absence kind of made the heart grow fonder and I had gotten to know a teacher at the high school and, and uh, as it turns out, we were married and I retired and moved back. And since I had all of this wonderful time on my hands, I contacted some of the folks in Cascade Locks, contacted George, uh, found out that he was the head of the charter committee and offered to work with the charter committee to see if I could help them get through some of the uh, obstacles they were facing at Hood River County since I had known quite a few of the people up there and thought maybe I could be of help. Uh, before I took Nestucca Valley, I had worked at the North Clackamas School District, which you know or may not know is three big, huge high schools, over 2,000. Um, I worked at um, the Sandy, well, it's now Oregon Trail School District. I worked for the Forest Grove School District. So I worked at a lot of big school districts. So my thought processes were, you know, a, a good size high school, you know, this not bad at about 1,200, 1,500, you know, fine like that, until I got the opportunity to work in a small district. Nestucca Valley has 600 students, right at 600 students. We had a 712 building of about 300 and got to see a different perspective of what it's like in a small community where everybody comes out to everything that you do. The grandparents, the parents, the community members, they're all there. That's what it's about. 
And I had the privilege of moving two of my granddaughters in with me down there, who uh, my oldest granddaughter graduated from Nesteca Valley High School, and my younger one is still there. But I began to see the value of small communities and the family atmosphere that exists and how important that is. And a hundred uh, electives <coughs> can't do the same thing for kids that need to have that family atmosphere as you can find in a small district. And that's why I was drawn to contact George and the committee up here and see if I could, could help in some way. Because I knew how vital this uh, was for your community to have your schools right in place. And I was involved in some of those early discussions knowing that there was declining enrollment here and that there were problems here. And I know that at that time there were other things that could have been done that would have made a difference and allowed you to keep your schools here. I know that from having worked in the situation that should Hood River County had wanted to, they could have moved some boundary lines to fill your schools in Cascade Locks. You had the room. They did not. I know that um, they could have created a magnet school down here. So rather than just mandating kids from, um, they're now currently in a different school district to come down here, they could have created a magnet school that could have attracted other students to Cascade Locks for whatever that you were offering. I know that when they decided to create Dos Mundos, which is their charter school, they could have located it in Cascade Locks. Instead, they bust two or three students from Cascade Locks up to Dos Mundos. They had to spend almost a half a million dollars to put in modulars next to Westside so that they could accommodate another 200 students when you had room for 200 students in Cascade Locks, and that didn't happen. I know that Hood River County School District could have worked cooperatively with the Cascade Locks Community Charter School to help you get a charter school established, and that didn't happen. So in coming into this process and in working with Hood River County right now, <coughs> I can tell you that I believe that there is no intention on the part of the superintendent there to establish your schools here or to see a charter school happen. And as I look at it right now, they have closed your high school, what, in 2009, and sent those kids up. In 2011, they closed the seventh and eighth grade. 2012, they're going to take your sixth graders. And you're going to be left with a K-5 school with 55 kids, 60 kids. How long do you think that they can afford at that rate to continue keeping a K-5 elementary here? I don't think that the picture looks very pretty unless we can come up with another idea. And when I finally came to that conclusion after working with Hood River County School District, George and I had another conversation of what other options were out there that the committee had <coughs> looked at before. And he mentioned that they had considered at one time a merger with another school district. One of the other school districts, it has to be with a, a a school district that is contigu contigu con contiguous. contiguous, that's the right word, contiguous to yours, which would be Corbett School District or Multnomah County. And of course, we were looking more at Corbett School District. In the, when I was at Nesteca Valley, Corbett was in the same uh, athletic league. And so I've spent a lot of time at Corbett, and I'm familiar with some of the programs and, and options they have there. But the legislature did something very unforeseen this last year, towards the end of the session when they do those kinds of things. Uh, and they passed a bill that allows for open registration, meaning you can take your student to any school in the state that you can get them to, as long as that school says they have room. And that's the key. Does that school say they have room? So this March, each school district can say, we have so much room in this grade, that grade, and the other grade to take students. That has not happened before. That's brand new. With that in mind, with the idea that Corbett is a contiguous school district and that there might be a possibility of merging with Corbett um, and going into that with open registration, 
the question came up, would Corbett be interested in merging with Cascade Locks, and would that be an advantage to Cascade Locks and allow Cascade Locks then to have the same reputation, since you'd be part of Corbett School District, as they do, and attract <coughs> students to this area. And so we contacted the superintendent at Cascade, at um, Corbett School District, to just bounce the ball around and say, would you be interested in this? And what do you think about it? And we learned through that visit that Corbett is bursting at the seams. We kind of knew that anyway, but they are bursting at the seams. They don't have room for all the kids they have. They have built such a reputation over the last few years that numerous students from East Multnomah County want to go to Corbett School District. And because of that, they, at one time they opened enrollment policies with the East Multnomah County Schools, but when money got tight, East Multnomah <coughs> County Schools said, no, we're not sending, we're not letting our kids go there anymore. And so they opened a charter school that allowed them to take those kids. Well, last spring they had over 100 kids on a waiting list that couldn't get in. And it's well known that you can't get into that because they have to do that with a lottery now. And once you get into the system, you c you're allowed to stay in the system. So the amount of seats that they have is always dwindling. But they have kids coming from uh, East Multnomah County as far as Welch's and as far as you get kids from David Douglas and even um, you have some kids from uh, Clackamas coming up there, willing to drive that far to have their kids in that school system because of the kind of reputation they have built and because of their small community atmosphere that you can have here. So last week, George and I went to Corbett to a school board meeting and wanted to know what they had to say. What would they think about it? What would their community think? And my understanding is there's lots of uh, uh, relationships between Corbett and Cascade Locks with families going back and forth and people that grow <coughs> up in the gorge and pe you know people there and they know people <coughs> down here. And um, <coughs> we shared with them a handout that I will give you a little bit later and talked to them about the possibility of a merger and um, answered questions for them. And the way the law is written, and there is a law that deals with it, it uh, as far as we know, it may not have ever been used at this point, but it's still there. And it would allow a merger of Cascade Locks and Corbett School District. Uh, and there's two ways to do it. One, all the districts could, could agree, Hood River County and, and uh, Corbett, that they wanted to do that, and the two SD ESDs, and they could do it. Or, if they didn't want to do it, the second possibility is that you can have a petition, and the law lays out what has to be in a petition, and it needs 5% of the registered voters in Hood River County School District, because that's the district you're part of, and 5% of the voters in Corbett School District to sign the petition. Once the petition is signed, then it's turned over to the, to, uh, the elections county for verification of the signatures. And then according to the process, it becomes law and it's done. There is the possibility that someone <coughs> in either one of those groups might not like that idea and they have the option, according to the law, to do the same thing. Um, but right now, you know, we're just focusing on, on what could happen here. We told the, the people at Corbett, as we gave them copies of the law, that the, the board doesn't have to take a vote. The Corbett School District Board doesn't have to vote on whether or not they want Cascade Locks. Uh, Hood River County School District Board doesn't have to take a vote on whether or not they want to let Cascade Locks go. The only way a, a vote is forced is if someone files a petition against it. And then it's a vote of the people in both areas. And everybody has to be agreed to that. So what we came tonight to share with you and we shared with them is that uh, there are people that are part of the charter committee that now are interested and, um, in, in drawing up the petitions and going out and getting the votes. 
And we wanted you to be aware of this. We wanted this community to be aware of it. We want to know what you think about the process. You know, if, if this is something you want, then we want to go for it. If it's not really something you want, then that's just a lot of energy and effort that we don't want to put out there. So we wanted to be able to answer any questions you had about um, the process and um, what that would mean for schools here. But I believe that by becoming part of the Corbett School District, that we could attract enough students to be able to open Cascade Locks again as a K-12 school in this area. And I think that's to your great advantage to be able to have your schools open again, to have your students back here, to have your athletic and your uh, arts events and the other things that are <coughs> happening, to be able to attract more people to this area, to your families to this area, industry to this area, as well as people that <coughs> just want to live here and want to come here and put their kids in your schools and live here. I think it can revitalize your community. So, uh, George, is there anything you want to follow up on? Or yeah, I, I just I want to make a point and, and say a couple things to let people realize that uh, we've worked extremely diligent, extremely hard to try to get a charter school. And at every avenue that we've taken, it, it just hit a stone wall. It, it was... We do all the work, we do everything, and then they say that's not enough. And so we work extremely diligent, extremely hard to try to get this to be done. And, and I say with a heavy heart because it, this is very difficult for me in an aspect because I graduated from Hood River Valley High. So I have a, an extreme sense of loyalty, but it it's became so apparent after hitting my head in the wall so many times that it, this was never going to happen. Okay, as far as the charter schools, they're just, they're not going to allow it. They're not going to listen to it. They're not going to let it happen. And, and the thing that, the reason why we did this in the first place was a group of people in the community were upset that we were losing our, our high school and our junior high. And, and now this year it's going to be our sixth grade. Okay. And, and, and when you stop and look at that, ad, that avenue, where is it heading? Why would they take our sixth graders? Those are our, our elementary kids. Those are first line of elementary kids. And now they're going to take them away from the school. So what's that going to accomplish for the school? Is that going to make the school more vibrant, taking more kids away? Eventually, they take enough kids away, there's no school anymore. Makes it really easy to do divide and conquer. And, and I believe that's what their intent is. And so I honestly believe that if, if we don't do something, in the next year or two, there'll be no K-5. There'll be no school here. They'll shut it down because it's not cost effective. Okay? And, and the problem that I see right now as being in the community is there's a huge hole that has been left in the community. And, and that hole has created several things. Number one, we don't go to the football games. We don't go to the basketball games. Okay? And now, the parents don't have a choice on where they get to send their kid. And, and in the United States, you're raised that you have a choice. You have an opinion. <coughs> you can state that. And you, can, you should always have that right to have a choice. Right now, there is no choice. I, unless you want to go to Corbett, if there's an opening in their charter school, you can, you can change. Okay? So right now, the parents that are here who have high school kids don't really have a choice if they can't afford to go to Corbett, then they have to go to Hood River. Okay. So now they're going to Hood River. Well, guess what? Now this has created a financial situation for the community. You now have parents that, when they get off work, they drive to Hood River. Okay. Now instead of shopping locally, because they're going to shop at Safeway and Rosars and Hood River, they're going to stop and get gas in Hood River. And now they're going to go, and when their kids get done with a basketball game or something, they're going to go down to McDonald's in Hood River. They're not going to be going to the East Wind. They're not going to be, you know, taking any advantages of the businesses here in the community. Okay, so this financially hurts the community. So this, you know, and I, I don't want to sound 
terrible bit, but the merger is the last choice that we have as far as trying to do something to have people in the community to be able to have a choice again on where they want their children to go to school. And it's always been the, the committees, when we first started up, we didn't care what the educational program was. We just wanted the ability to be able to keep our children in this community. And I believe that this is a very viable option. I have to go out and get signatures and you know, I'll go door to door if I have to in Hood River and, and do whatever it takes to get enough signatures to try to make this happen. And I think it's a very good idea for, for the city of Cassidy Lock. I think it'd be good for the economy. It'd be good for the parents again and the children again to be able to come home. And that's all I have. If you have any particular questions, things that, about the laws and different things, go ahead and ask and I can tell you them to the best of my ability. Well, first of all, thank you both very much. <coughs> thank you for a lot of work into this, tireless efforts, um, and they go into, they're looking through every avenue to make this work. So, um, you know, I, we'll, we'll have a chance for questions, but I just, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to you and everyone on that charter, charter school committee that's, that's looked into, uh, you know, what we can do to, to restore choice in education. I don't think I'll add to what George said about the charter law. The one thing that I found out as I was working through this is when they tell you everything you have to do for a charter, it is ODE wants, Oregon Department of Education wants A, B, C, and D, and it's all listed in law. And then at the end, there's another little clause that says, and whatever else the school district may require. And that's the clause that has hung them up all the time. Because if a school district doesn't want a charter, they can just keep adding something to that, whether it's even reasonable. And that's what happened. Something kept getting added that wasn't reasonable, and it kept changing. So uh, that's all that I want to say as far as that part goes. Uh, the other question that, has, that came up that you probably would be interested in is, is what happens to your property, your school right here? And one of the things that um, I think that, that law allows or law requires is that your school right here, your 12-acre campus, I believe that's what it is right now, and I believe that what you have all together is a 42,983 square foot uh, building, along with the music building, the remodeled gym, the science lab, and all the rest of that. All of that would go to the Corbett School District. And uh, there, there would be negotiations with Hood River County School District uh, over what other pieces go with it. You all have paid your taxes here. Corbett doesn't have to buy your schools. They are your schools. You've paid the taxes on those schools. That last bond that was passed, you passed here, and it raised your taxes. You're paying for all the additions on that school. So they would be your school. And it would go that direction. Should you not be able to reestablish your schools and they get closed and they're still part of Hood River County School District, who do you think would get to sell your school and where would that money go? So that's just a, a, another piece of the puzzle that I found. And so I do have a handout because you probably won't remember with everything else, all the important things you have to do right now, uh, everything that uh, we brought up tonight. So I have some. We got other questions. Sure, I love to answer any questions we could. Any questions about the school district? I think that's enough there. I've got a couple more. If you would like to. I would like to ask a question. Could we have a town hall meeting on what you just said? Love to. I think the town is, is ready for it. They've been ready for it for quite some time. Can we have the petitions there at the same time? You betcha. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. it uh, 
I'd like to move to the council comments. If there's people that have other questions, we'll get to those. Uh, but Randy, you had you had a question. Yeah, I did. I, Hood River uh, School District made a lot of financial decisions, which you alluded to. What would keep Corbett School District from making those same decisions? What what guarantees do you think uh, could be in place? If you run into the situation, if if we're wrong, and you can't fill that building, and people don't want to come out here, they would be faced with the same same situation. But right now, as you're looking at it, is they're debating whether or not to remodel their uh, old Springdale school so that they have more room. And even if they decide to borrow the money and remodel that school, it'll take three years before it's ready for kids. They have at least 100 more kids right now that need a place. Mm -hmm. And as long as you have kids coming, you get, the fine, you get the dollars for those kids, and there would be no reason to close it. They're in a situation up there with zoning laws that they can't build anything more. I mean, they have huge zoning issues, 80 acres to put a house on in some cases. And so you're not seeing more building going in. And so there are people that want to move to that area. There are, isn't any building. What is there is too expensive. We're, you're reasonable down here, especially compared to Corbett or to Hood River. I think you are a very viable to have that same program. And that would be the difference, is that you would have to join, um, you would be part of their school district, you would be governed by their superintendent, by their bo board policies, uh, you would be set up like they are set up. One of the things that they believe strongly in, and one of the reasons, I, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Corbett School District for, gosh, eight, nine years, maybe longer than that, has been recognized by US News and World Report as one of the 100 best high schools in the nation. Is that their charter high school? No, it, it was their high school before they had a charter. And they went to that charter after they couldn't fill those in. And their previous superintendent took over that school district at a time in which um, academically they were doing very poor. And he instituted a number of different programs that changed that school academically. And then it became a magnet for other people and for other, other parents that wanted their kids into that school because you have the best of both. You've got a small school, family environment, and you've got a quality academic program. And um, I won't say much for their athletic program because Ms. Stecker Valley usually beat them. But they did <laughs> have a good, they do have a good academic program. And um, somebody else has to worry about that. I, I, I want to say one thing. Go ahead, George. George because yeah. I, I want to answer Randy's question a little bit. The other thing that, that they've made quite apparent to us is it's approximately $5,800 a year that the state gives for each and every student to be educated. And that's what they pay a school district. Okay? So they're currently educating their kids there for that much money. Okay? Cascade Locks is considered a small rural school district. And so they have a multiplier. It's one and a half times that. So they're going to get approximately $8,800 for every student that they educate that goes to school in Cascade Locks. Okay. So they know financially that they could educate the kids that we have right now for the amount of money that's being paid by the state. Okay. So. Right now, effectively, Hood River is just taking that extra money and putting it elsewhere into their programs throughout Hood River County. Okay, so financially, they know that they can educate their our children for fifty-eight hundred dollars. So there shouldn't be any issue about whether or not they can continue to do so because they'll be getting paid from the state more money. Okay. Yeah, I guess I would check check that because I understood that our doors have been closed for the kids that have been transferred out. And we had a three year That's a four year when you shut down a high school there's four years. And what the way that was written was, okay, when you shut down a high school, if you have fifty four kids, which is what we have, when they shut down the high school there was fifty four kids in the high school. Okay? So that means for the next four years Hood River is guaranteed payment for 54 students, whether or not 54 students go there, okay? So, in essence, there's probably 20 kids going to school there right now, 
Okay, so that means that they're getting paid an extra $8,800 for 34 kids that aren't, they're not even educating at this time. I, okay. I understood that, but uh, once but that let time's me up, but once that time's up, that's four years. Yes, Hood River will not get that anymore. But if the small rural funding stays with the school, you can talk to Michael Wingfong at the state, and I'll talk to him, and he says that that small rural funding stays with the address at the school. And uh, just to, to clarify, Randy, so if Cascade Locks K-12 school is reopened, then we qualify as a small rural rural <coughs> school again. And I was so that under, window hasn't. And I was under the understanding that that door is, is closed, so that we will not get the extra funding. At, so at this point, with the, the way it's even if we reopen it. Okay, so and then, and then also some clarification. To, to address that your earlier point, Connie, could you also talk about board representation? Because I think it was about five years ago, um, Hood River County School District unilaterally removed our representation on their school board. Cascade Locks used to have a representative um, to, the, to the school board, and we currently, I mean, by name, we we do, we're, we're combined with 5,000 other people. In, in the west end of Hood River County. If this merger were to happen, would we have a representative on the Corbett School Board? The way I'm understanding the, the law works, it now, works now, that they would, by the next election, have to relook at the population, and they would have to put us in one of their zones, like you do right now. You're in a population zone, not a, a, a mileage zone. So. Uh, that's what they, what they would have to do. I'm thinking probably with their size, you might very well have a voting member again. I can't guarantee that because somebody would have to sit down with the maps. And especially, you know, if you attract more people to this area, which I believe a good K-12 school in the Corbett School District would do, that would change too the amount of people you have here and thus whether or not you have representation, voting representation on the board. As you know, uh, Liz Whitmore is your voting representative on the board currently at the Hood River County School District. But uh, she is from Westside and she's very, uh, very supportive of the folks at Westside because that's where the majority of the people come. So. Jeff, two questions, uh, Mrs. Kennedy. First, Maybe I missed it, but what was the response from the Corbett School District and any of their parents and or the superintendent about this proposed merger when you talked to them? What was, the, what was their temperature gauge of that? And I have another question after that. Okay. Uh, since they weren't asked to take a vote, because they don't have to vote, what we can say is um, <clears throat> as far as the superintendent talked with folks, he asked them to call him back. Five of the seven called him back with high, ho high support very high support. He didn't hear from the other two. The other two talked to us. We talked individually to those, all of them, that night, and they were all positive. Uh, he believes that this is a go. He strongly supports it. Um, well, I would say he supports it. Uh, I think he has to deal with all the issues up there. But yes, he's very supportive, and I believe that the majority of the school board is supportive as well, if not all of the school board. And there was approximately probably 20 people that weren't on the school board mm -hmm. that was there. Mm -hmm. And a couple of people got up and talked in favor of it mm -hmm. after we did the presentation, which we didn't even know them. They thought it was a great idea. And so, and then I talked and mingled with several of the people. And they all, you know, there's a lot of old ties with people in town. Mm -hmm. You know, Phil Nolan and basketball and people that he knows. And, you know, and they went back and forth with Corbett. So they, they feel kind of a kinship with us, like we're their cousin. And that, you know, they can understand the situation. Jeff, did you have another question? Yes. The next part of that question was, one of the things we've heard about is busing our children from uh, Cascade Locks to Hood River. That's been the biggest issue and the, the time spent in that. And as uh, Mr. Fisher pointed out, the economic downturns that that causes for uh, our own uh, businesses here. But what makes you think or believe that people would be willing to bus their children here from Corbett area and that are in that Corbett school district to come here? 
That's that's the gamble. I, that's the dice that I see being rolled right here. We're talking about busing again, and it's a 20-minute drive. We're halfway between the two, basically Corbett and Hood River. So, what makes you believe that they'll want to come here? First of all, I, we're not so much talking about Corbett kids coming here. We're talking about East Multnomah County, which is even farther. And if you're aware of East Multnomah County, uh, Gresham Barlow School District, Reynolds School District, there are a number of small K-8 schools over there, private schools, Christian schools, as well as charters and other ones, other schools that don't, do not want their children in those large school districts, and so they carpool. There are people from Sandy carpooling to Corbett. There are people from Sandy carpooling to LaSalle. There are people willing to put carpools together to go anywhere. And that's, that's the kids and the parents that you find that are willing to send their kids here. Those that are often have one parent that isn't working and so they can have a situation where they can carpool their kids. Uh, Randy gave throughout the idea, Randy Tranny, the superintendent at Corbett, throughout the idea, well, what if we put one bus at um, <clears throat> the mall in Troutdale and everybody got their kids there? That's different. Those kind of parents are willing to drive their kids to have a small community environment and a quality educational system. And I just, I just want to add to that, uh, as a professional educator, I mean, parents that are committed, that are, that are searching for the right schools for their children, are going to take advantage of the open enrollment policy wherever they end up. Here's an opportunity for those committed families uh, to bring their students to top quality educational program, one of the best in the country, and we'd have it right here in Cascade Those are Those are the kind of parents and families they're going to lead to success uh, for the school wide as well as their as well as their uh, individual students. I, I've got a couple of things to say about Corbett School District, but I wanted to get Randy in one more time. Yeah, and I'm all about K-12 here in Cascade Locks. Don't get me wrong. So, uh, a couple. You mentioned the votes of the boards versus the votes of the public. What? Uh, it sounded like the votes of the boards would be. There is the the law. To do. Yeah, the law. Not yeah, the, the law provides two different ways to do it. One, Hood River County and Corbett boards could vote and say, yes, we want to do that. Then the ESDs would, Multnomah ESD and Columbia Gorge ESD would have to vote to do it, and they could all get together and do it. We don't believe that will happen. Oh, so exactly. we're not going that way. What way we're going is the petition way, where community members can put together a petition from, from uh, the uh, Hood River County School District, which George and I are part of, and community members that you just have to have one person that's willing to be their uh, chief petitioner in Corbett and then get their votes, which we figure right around 140 votes, 145 votes up there and close to 500, right around 500 here in Hood River County. That's all the votes we need, on a, uh, not all the votes, that's all the signatures we need on petitions to make it happen. And then it's just a process of it happening. Unless someone files petitions, they would also have to go through the same process. And I won't get into that because it's pretty complicated. It's in law. But they'd have to file petitions saying they wanted it stopped. So it doesn't go to a public vote. Then it would go to a public vote. If an opposition were created. If there's no opposition to petitions, it doesn't go to a public vote. Right. It does not go to a public vote. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments, Mark? So, you know, Corbett's at full capacity now, so, and, you know, we have an empty high school. You know, what would the mixture be? I mean, would most of our kids stay in town then, the high school kids here? All of our kids would stay in town. Uh -huh. All of our kids would stay in town, unless the parents, and see, that's, that's the point where I get back to having a choice. The parents have a choice to send their children wherever they want now. Mm -hmm. So if they want their children to continue to go to Hood River, they can't. If they want their children to try to go to court, they could go to Wasco, up to the Dow, wherever they want. They have that choice to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got a carpool going up there. And then how would sports work? Would they? How, how, how would sports work? You know, like at, at high school, the, the football, 
Well, the sports are always regulated by the OSAA. And, and sports will be, we'll probably still, depending on how big the high school is, we'll still be a single A school. And so, you know, and I know this isn't, shouldn't be one of the aspects of looking at why you would come to Cascade Locks, but some kids would look at the fact that, hey, I can't, I, I've always been on the second squad at Hood River. I've always been on the second squad in Portland. I could, or even at Corbett, I could go to Cascade Locks and I'm a good enough athlete that I'd get to play all the time. So you'll have some people that'll be driven by sports to come down and say, we want to play in a small district school. That way we can compete. You know, and so it's, that's just kind of another little sales pitch. But you see what I'm saying? There's, there's that avenue. And then once they get here and they realize what a small school is like, it's, it's, it's hard to explain unless, unless you've been around it a lot. And it, it becomes such a kinship and, and such a, you know, everybody knows everybody. And it's, it's, it's just a really good situation. Well, I, I just say that I just say that I appreciate that the charter committee is uh, still making the effort. Obviously, Cascade Locks doesn't want to be where they're at. They, they didn't want to go to Hood River, and but there is a group of people that have worked really hard and put in time and effort in it, and and uh, I'm in favor of continuing to let you know whatever it is, whatever it is, wherever we can go, whatever angle. We've got to continue moving with that angle because I, I believe that it is, it is hugely important for Cascade Locks to have a to have a school here in in the town. It's not going to happen through through Hood River County. It's not going to happen, and it is going to get closed totally down. You can, you can count on that. Um, also, I, I think the corridor right now buses from Bonneville, so, I, so they already sent a bus all the way out to to Bonneville. So I would assume there's the potential for the dots and model kids to be able to, to, come, to come here. The bus is already, it's already coming within four miles of yeah. us, a quarter of us. See, again, that gives the parents of, bon of Dotson and Bonneville the, the opportunity to decide, do we want to drive all the way up to Corbett or do we want to send, because once the, the program gets established, you know, it, it's going to be the same scenario. Well, they used to, they used to come to Cassie. A lot of them, uh, some of them. So if the athletes, students came from that area, but they chose to go to Corbett because they we're going to get better education in there. If, right. if we're able to tie in with them, there's a very positive, strong possibility that, that we can attract those students. So if we left here in this meeting and, and people were to say, um, did the city council endorse it or do you think the city council supports it? Well, <coughs> what would we say? Would we say, I mean, I can't ask you to vote, but would I say you're all smiling and that you, that you <laughs> were positive? <laughs> in, in just a minute, you'll get to hear from all Okay. Yes and no. Um, you'll have to continue to pay your taxes that you, um, where you voted to raise your taxes with Hood River County until those bonds are done. You owe Hood River County that amount of money. And so you will not take on any money, any of the bills that, that Corbett has or any bonds that they have out there. You'll pay your own bills, they'll pay their own bills. Should they come up with a system that they wanted to, to build something else, you would be part of that vote. And if you voted to tax yourself, then you would be taxed. But right now, you'll be responsible for yours and they'll be responsible for theirs, just as when Chenoweth and uh, uh, North Wasco, well, Chenoweth and the Dalles became North Wasco. Chenoweth pays their own taxes and North and uh, the Dalles pays their own. They got stuck with a beautiful new middle school and Chenoweth is enjoying it, but they would have rather been in their middle school. So, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, the law states we have to be responsible for whatever debt we currently have. Yeah, I'm really concerned about that. So well, I know. My concern was concerned about the county. The yeah. my county taxes are a lot. Only, the only tax that we could ever be responsible for would be a school tax. Okay. Because we're still going to be in Hood River County. The only thing that's changed is the boundary line for the school district. Okay. All right. And then uh, I think you answered it, but what's 5% of our uh, 
I mentioned it take five percent of the voters. It takes five percent of Hood River County School or Hood River County, and they're okay. roughly twenty one thousand, so that's gonna be five hundred voters. Okay. Now in Corbett there's roughly twenty six hundred voters, okay, in the Corbett School District. So that's gonna be roughly a hundred and thirty maybe hundred and forty voters there. Okay. Okay. And as far as the infrastructure of the city, that goes with the results of the petition. Yeah, as far as the property and the well, property building. and the school are automatic. Okay. okay, but then the things that they have to set down and negotiate are different. Like, well, how many school buses should go with Cascade Lock? Sure. And that'll be negotiated, but that's only after the fact. Understood. Okay. That's good. So one of the things I just want to make clear, because through professional development as as an educator, I did have the opportunity to interview about that um, at length. Uh, about the, the transformation that, that he helped to lead in Corbett School District. This is a phenomenal school district. Uh, you just don't find public schools in America that run about at the, this level of quality. I mean, it is a tremendous opportunity um, for, for our community uh, to, to be involved. Um, it's uh, the you know, the, the work that they put into developing an educational model that um, that reaches all students at their level and takes them places that really public schools just, just have a hard time doing anymore, it is just amazing. It, it is a tremendous opportunity. You know, I think about my um, one-year-old daughter and to have her have the opportunity to be involved in that kind of education is tremendous. And I just, I just think it's, it's a great opportunity, um, and it's, you know, you know, hopefully we can, we can get people in Hoover County to understand uh, that, you know, that this K-12 school has, you know, when I used to work there, we talked about this school is the living room of the community. In the last five years, they took out a chainsaw and cut down a tree and crashed it into our living room, and they're, they're continuing to do that year by year. And, and just take away the school bit by bit. Well, we have an opportunity to, to get out our own chainsaw and cut that tree out and rebuild our house. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I have to say absolutely support this 100%. Um, the other thing is for, for years, the Hood River County School District, been, since I started working there 10 years ago, they've been saying it costs us more to educate kids in Cascade Locks than anywhere else. In, in our district, uh, that it's a drain on our general fund. Well, here we've got a school district just down the road, a contiguous school district, sharing the same borders, that can do it and actually make a profit. Um, so they're going to have a real hard time trying to make the case that now we can't, we can't let this happen because, you know, it might maybe it's an asset or something, because for years they've been downgrading um, school in Cascade Locks. Um, so it's, it's going to be a real difficult, difficult argument to make, which makes this all the more important for us to be doing right now. Um, when you think about, like George is saying, and I can't, couldn't agree more, you think about choice in education, you know, and the opportunity for families to choose their own schools, what works best for their kids. Well, the state legislature, for, for whatever faults they have in, in terms of understanding the public education system, here's one thing they got right, at least for our community. And, and I think that it, it would be silly for us not to, um, to support this. Um, for the families and for the future of Cascade Locks. So that, that's where I stand. And, and I, I, hopefully I didn't, I didn't center too much on the negative here because the message I'd like to give uh, out from this meeting is this is a win-win situation for everybody. It's win-win for Cascade Locks to be part of this other school system because we need more kids and more people in this community, and you'll get it that way. It's a win-win for Corbett because they need the space. They also believe in what they're doing, and they want to see it continue and expand because they believe in kids and they believe in what they're. They believe their programs are vital for kids, so they're looking. At, they're anticipating being part of our, our school district. They're positive about that. And it's a win-win for Hood River because it, they have described us almost as an economic albatross. And if we're that for them, 
let us go. Let you all go and see what you can do somewhere else. Then they don't have to worry about how much money they're losing down here. So it's win-win for everybody. Well, thank you very much. Again, the work that the Charter Committee and George personally has put up with uh, is, is the community really owes a, a, a debt to the work they've done. Hey, Gail, you have one more comment. I know you Go ahead, Gail. Well, yeah, thanks. Well, I, I think one thing she was hinting at or asking is, should we have a consensus of the council that endorses the Posey idea? Or, or sure, let me just ask the question. Is there anyone that has a problem with this, with, with proceeding with this? I don't do anything. Thank you. Last comment. I, 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 I don't have kids, but I like the idea and I'd like to support it. If for no other reason, it would really be interesting to see ultimately, you know, five years from now, how many Hood River kids, because of the difference in the quality of education, oh, yeah. Yeah. chose to come to Cascade Rock for school. I think it's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to ask a question. Is there anyone interested in a break or are we ready to move on to our next agenda? Yeah, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. This uh, this action came from a discussion that one of the council members had with Mary Ann, and because she's our uh, finance officer, I'm going to turn it over to her to make the report and the recommendation. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, you have before you uh, the old resolution and the new resolution. Um, it is um, the policy of the uh, council that that we follow our, our uh, resolutions ordinance. And the current policy, which is uh, resolution 1218, uh, is very inefficient and requires a purchase order for each expense regardless of the amount. So if we went to this hardware store and needed to buy two bolts, we would need a PO. Uh, that's an inefficient way to, to do business. The spending limits would not change uh, for the department heads, uh, but the acquisition process would. Uh, so, I have before you also uh, a new resolution, 1227, um, that addresses that, and we're asking that council approve that resolution so that uh, we can be more efficient in our process of uh, purchasing goods uh, for normal business situations. discussion on whether it was an action or non action
suggestion would be that we have one place and one resolution that covers how expenditures are managed. And I think that could be accomplished by taking under Ordinance 259 that has Section 7 that tries to account for how expenditures are approved. But again, it's kind of fuzzy because it says, shall be expended in the same manner as other city funds. And I'm not sure what the hell that means. It seems like there ought to be something that says a department approval, city administrator approval, or council approval by some dollar amount or something. But um, that's a suggestion. Whatever section seven would be in the consolidated resolution. And then in ordinance 304, section eight kind of has the same fuzzy wording that uh, they'll be expended following the city procedures. Is that, is that section 10? Ten, correct. Okay. Same, but the same language as section seven in the two <coughs> Yeah. But try to real life, right. literal life approval process. Because I think the tourism, those aren't, are those supposed to come to council or what's the? In, in my understanding, uh, tourism is uh, not authorized to make expenditures. They are authorized to make recommendations to council for expenditures. Um, that was the process I understand from these re resolutions in the same way with parks and recreation. Okay. Well, whatever. Or the ordinance, excuse me. Ordinance. Whatever is the suggested control <coughs> points, I think, ought to be liberal. That's all I have. Okay. Other comments on this report? So uh, there's a couple things that Gail brought up, and I just want to clarify uh, as we move uh, this report from reports and presentations into action uh, the future meeting. Uh, he suggested that we make an uh, addition to section four, subsection A, um, to, in, to explicitly indicate purchase orders not being required for purchases under the spending authority. Is there anyone who has a, a problem with or opposes that idea? So moving forward with this particular resolution, um, that seems like a, a plan. But do you have the agreement with that? Okay. Um, with regard to two other ordinances, I don't think those are necessarily addressed um, in this particular resolution. Do you disagree with that, Gail? Right, they're not. And do you think they should be? I think they, I think they should be. So the, I think the problem we run into there is we have existing ordinances, two, 259 and 304, that would, if, if we were to try to use resolution 
seven to uh, to change how tourism and recreation uh, expand their funds, that would be that would be different than what the resolution or the ordinances currently say. And and an ordinance is considered uh, to have more authority than a resolution. So. And so you so if we if we do what you're suggesting, you'd have a resolution that's in conflict with two ordinances, and therefore that res and since the resolution doesn't have the same authority as the ordinance, those sections of the resolution would therefore um, not be valid. So I think we'd have to address those ordinances separately. My idea for that is that both of those ordinances address city committees. On the docket for a December meeting, we have um, a work session on our policy for boards, committees, and commissions. I think that would be the appropriate time okay. to address those ordinances. Okay. Well, whatever the mechanics are, I think the intent is, you know, I, mean, I don't care if there's a comment and a resolution yeah. that refers to the ordinance with it liberalized. How, whatever the mechanics yeah, you are. You want to be consistent. I, I, one, you should be consistent and you should have one point of reference. And I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think that yeah. you, you have to address an ordinance as an ordinance. Okay, I, and there's okay. a process for that. You can't do it through a resolution. Okay. So is there anyone that objects to holding off on making those changes regarding the, the tourism and recreation ordinances until we get to that work session where we address our committees? Who, who's supposed to remember that? You. you. We will. We will. We will. <laughs> <laughs> See, Gail, the way it works, it's Marianne and Kathy remember everything. Okay. That's the way it works. Okay, are there any other comments uh, from the council about uh, these, two, these two resolutions? Okay. Marianne, you put on Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, moving on then to our next uh, agenda item, uh, it is a report on year-to-date financial, it's a year-to-date financial report. Um, I, I see that our staff report was prepared by Marianne, are you prepared to talk about it? She will when I turn it over to her, yeah. Okay, we'll start with Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, you have in front of you uh, a product that Marianne has been working on for the last eight or nine years. So, and, it's, and it was to the point where we actually were going to super glue her to her chair until this actually came forward. So, um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Mary Ann because you have in front of you the first of the financial reports off of the new system. Mary Ann. Thanks, Paul. Um, as some of council knows, and the new ones that might not know how we got to this uh, process, I did give you a little synopsis on how we uh, got our new accounting system. Um, our old accounting system was too antiquated. It was outdated, unable to uh, update it. Our payroll system, uh, which was also part of that old system, would not support state tax improvements that they just uh, did this last uh, year. So we did very, uh, a lot of work, Shrell, myself, uh, Bernard and, and our consultants did a lot of work, and we came to the conclusion that Cassell was the best uh, for our box. Um, however, in the transition of the conversion, uh, we were very pleased with our conversion of the utility building. Uh, it went fairly smooth with the little, little bumps in the road, but Sherelle was diligently on top of it and got it taken care of. Um, the general ledger was a little bit more difficult, and I thought that was going to be the easiest, but it, it, it proved not to be. Um, until you understand how the system integrates to the other modules, it's very tough to balance. And I was having a lot of difficulty uh, with that process and getting Kels Cassell and the support staff to explain to me that process so I could understand what parts need to balance and what, what reports create that balancing so that I know that I'm in balance every every month. Um, thanks to Paul's help um, and uh, Gail for 
pushing us to that point. Uh, we did get Cassell to uh, give me two people to work with, which has helped tremendously, which has brought forth this product. Um, balance, I have to say. I still have some questions of them, but I have a balanced product. Uh, we still have some work, or I still have some work, but uh, I'm very confident that uh, you know over the next couple of months uh, we will have more of a financial uh, report for you. I'm bringing this to you for you to think about what type of report do you want to see. Do you want to see 47 pages of line items, or do you want to see a uh, synopsis of the financial that gives you a better idea of how each department is doing and how the city is doing overall. Um, this is just information for you to see what the system does. In the old system, I would take a similar report, actually it was two to three different types of reports, and I would combine them into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, very time consuming, but that's what we had to work with. This now does it for you. It gives you uh, the report. I just need to know the type of report I can see. If you have any suggestions or ideas, I do have one suggestion from a council member that I'm trying to implement uh, now and uh, we'll bring forward to you. I think he shared it with most of you. Um, but again, any other information you would like to see or financial you'd like to do, Paul and I are gonna be working together and getting a more, um, a smaller, I should say, a smaller report not so much different information, but more combined information, so you don't have 47 pages to go through to get a financial overview of the city and the fund. But basically that is uh, my presentation. Uh, any feedback you have, any information um, over the next uh, week would be greatly appreciated. If I could do it tonight, that's fine too. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Mm -hmm. Are there questions or comments from the council? What, what was the oh, uh, oh, hold on, Tom okay. person? I, I just uh, if a person needed to voice out pages for whatever reason, it's not hard to put that together, so they don't have to have it. We could have the shorter version of it. Mm -hmm. If there's something in the sort shorter version that we're going, I'd like to get a little more beyond that to be able to get something beyond that. Should be a pretty simple thing to do. This is a that. very simple process: okay. one button and it produces okay. a report. Okay. Once I've got all the data into it, you can yeah. okay. And that's an even, even an easier process than the old. Okay. Randy? Well, uh, and so would one button produce the 47 pages? Yeah. Would that? Once the data is inputted. Could that post to the website? Uh, yeah, I just have to get with Kathy, I, I believe, because I think we can, yeah. So that might be a way to disseminate it so it's open and transparent. But what was the one suggestion? On the financial um, there is a, a report um, that Council Member um, Lewis has proposed. It basically is a smaller report. It gives you uh, year to date. It asks that it actually gives you quarter to date, and then it asks the department managers to forecast the lease forecast, um, and then gives you an annual and gives you percentages. Very nice looking report. I'm just trying to implement it. Gail might be able to extract on that a little bit. Gail, would you just talk about that report? Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You might get coffee too, but but the idea being that quarterly anyway, that the department heads be given a current status of their revenues and expenses, and that they reforecast what their revenues and forecasts are intended to be for the following year, so that if there's changes that we would know about those ahead of time <coughs> as a part of a forecast and then every quarter they would re-forecast for the remainder of the year and it's just a summary by fund not detail it would be 47 pages there should be what one page per fund right at most at most i mean yeah. you could probably put a, like five right. funds on a on right. a, a sheet be maybe two or three sheets so it'd be most. forty thousand feet and then if you had questions or something, you could drill down and give us a little bit of detail. Now that would be a quarterly report. Um, it could turn into a monthly report if you didn't want department heads to forecast. I think 
forecasting quarterly is a good idea, but monthly might take a little bit. I think you'd be doubling your work to know monthly. Okay, yeah. I, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the significance of these reports. It's just not the, the first reports out of the new system that represent this, but it's the first opportunity out of the new system since we started the new budget year for the department managers now to get a copy of their budget so they can actually see literally where they're at rather than have to ask how much money do I have or I don't know how much money I have, et cetera, et cetera. So, so now we're into the monthly cycle yes, each of review. Each department head received in their box today uh, <coughs> this report based on their department. So you know, Tracy got his department, uh, Sheldon got his department. They are up to date. Yeah. And then the last tricky thing you're going to try to figure out is how to put page numbers on. Yes, I am. I, I apologize. I was brought to my attention that there's no page numbers, so I'm going to see what I can do about the page numbers. Okay. That's all I got. I was just going to ask Marianne, what's your suggestion? I mean, what, you know, you, you did soft time. I mean, what, what, would you, what would you recommend? Well, my recommendation is <clears throat> somewhat similar to, to what we had previously. Um, because you're, you might not be interested in the detail, but you are interested in how the fund is doing. Um, so if you're interested in each category as we budget personal services, materials and service, capital expense, that would be enough, that would be one way. If you're just interested in the bottom line of the fund, that would be another way. I'm really open to suggestions of what's gonna make your job easier. Um, what I have to do would be just to format and format another report. Um, it's it's I hope and I haven't worked with it, but I hope it'll be very simple to do uh, with one of the, the modules that we do have. So it's really up to you. What is going to satisfy you in in the report to give you the best information to make the best decision? So uh, that's why I'm very open. I mean, Paul might have some suggestions. I haven't. We haven't had a chance to discuss my presentation on the 19th, but I'm sure that will uh, be part of that. But I'd like to know your feedback on how you as <coughs> individuals or business people would like to see it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not that interested if some account got their 40 cents of interest credited to them accurately, but um, by fund uh, cash, cash standing, um, would be something I'd be interested in. You, you, you used to do that. And, and you have the cash, ca combined cash investment is the very first page. That tells you what each fund has um, part of cash and investments in the, uh, in the pool. But uh, what, what you used to do uh, would be a bar graph on how it yeah, changes yeah. month to month or quarter to quarter, whatever is going to be interesting. That is that is correct. I did do a bar graph. It well, the system <coughs> put out something like that to track the, the major category changes is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Not it would not be. I don't believe it would be that difficult to do it, even if I had to do it on Excel spreadsheet. It's just not that. I don't believe it would be that difficult. Whether the system can do bar graphs, I'd have to ask that. We didn't get into that part. Um, my, then this is just my opinion based on the four years I've been here. I felt that those bar graphs were not looked at. So to me, it was a waste of ink and a waste of paper. But if that's what you choose that you'd like to see, I'll be more than happy, happy to reinstitute that. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't have to be in a bar graph format. That's just the easiest to visualize. But where, you know, the dollars, if we have a declining balance in... So you're looking for cable. comparables. Yeah, comparables. That we have a declining balance in our cable TV system, so to speak, that would show up as a comparable rather yes. than just erosion over a longer period of time. We might not notice it. It depends on whether you want See comparables, the going down. comparables for one year or if you want comparables for, I mean, not one year, by month, because I gave you a, a, a one year comparable graph chart. So are you looking for comparables for just two months or are you looking for comparables for the whole year? For the whole year. Does 
the snapshot approach that you talked about, Marianne, earlier, I think is something I'd like to see, a smaller condensed version, but what Gail had talked about also with that, the forecasting, I think of seeing that in a quarterly mm -hmm. approach uh, is very beneficial for us, like maybe the other council members to see what goes on, but that condensed version, because like you said, the 40 some pages, we can get it any time from yeah, any other questions. want some idea of maybe some possible reports I can produce for you that will give you an idea of what we'd be looking at. And, you know, my, my feedback is that, you know, I thought that the Gail's proposal was good. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a quarterly look and then an opportunity to readjust. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that answers. Uh, it gives me some ideas. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we'll return to this discussion. So now we'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is the RFQ request for quotes for planning services. <coughs> Mayor, members of City Council, you have before you a sample RFQ for planning services. Currently, the city has a contract for planning services that uh, has an hourly rate of $135 an hour and may not necessarily serve a small rural community. So in previous discussions with the previous council, we had discussed the idea of going out for proposals and then capping that at maybe $100 an hour. It, it isn't a cost that the city is going to take on at this point. What's critical about this is getting, getting you with a planner who has a uh, sense of what it's like to be do development reviews uh, in a small rural community for a rate that I don't think needs to exceed $100 an hour. So this is the first draft of that concept for you to take a look at and see if this is a direction you want to go. And again, this is not an action item. This is a discussion item. You give us some direction <coughs> and we'll either drop the idea or we'll refine it and come back to you at some later date with a proposal to go out for formal, formal requests for proposals. Okay, questions or comments? Um, I think a year ago we, we had a uh, planner that was 45 an hour, if I'm not mistaken, was the, the bill rate and all that. So I, I guess we I was 55. <coughs> it was 55? We, we had increased it to 55. And then, and then in the last year it's been 135. Is that uh, your proposal shows $100 an hour, and I, I guess I'm hesitant to, to put that out there. Maybe we'll find somebody for 75 or, or 65 and we're almost baiting them to come in at $100. Um, so that's that's the only comment. Other, other than that, I, I like it. Would, would there be a way to kind of not put a dollar amount um, in there? I, I think that is possible. Uh, my, my intent of putting it in there was to get you to set a cap so that if somebody needs 136 an hour or 150 uh, and some of these people go f go for those rates without any trouble that you begin to set that parameter we also could go out without a number and then see what you get and then gravitate to what you think you can afford yeah, I'd, I'd hate to see some of those lower ones kind of come up to what our expectation is, and then, then everybody's at 100. <laughs> so, other than maybe shopping price. Right. And what the typical rates are. Yeah. Well, the other approach would be to send that, send that out at 50 <coughs> and either get none or one. If we get none, then send it out at 75. <laughs> I mean, I would defer to your wisdom. Well, that's why I said not to exceed, because you're sending out a signal. There are, there are few planning firms doing business in Oregon who have a sensibility about a small rural community. We can get a lot of the big ones. Uh, but it's hard to find, and it's probably more important to get a 
a firm and the resources who can relate to a small rural community and where you want to go uh, than the dollar amount is. Would, would, yeah, it, right. would it be possible to target the five or six or eight of them to do small, small rural communities um, specifically uh, to get their uh, response back? And then maybe have the Bureau of Commerce covered for right. our legal yeah. obligations. Yeah. Counselor, it is, and I've talked to three or four of them. They had no problem with having that. They'd probably be well below that. The, the other opportunity that might exist, and I haven't pursued it, is that there may be a neighboring community uh, who has a planner who has some experience. Uh, but I think once we get the RFQ and know what it is we're looking for, we could go. I could go meet with some and say, hey, how about your planning staff nearby us doing some work for us for whatever your municipal rate is. We may on the planning commission before working with a city planner who was on staff for that contract at time, uh, John Morgan specifically, and then working with or not being able to work with somebody where you rely upon staff as the uh, quasi planner who will try to interpret the codes and you have sitting on planning commission looking to staff trying to have these, co these questions answered and there's sometimes that five seconds of uh, very silence not sure when we have to ask a question. I think it's important that we position ourselves through our economic development plan that we're doing that we have the right people in place for this and not so much as a contracting type thing but maybe as, as needed basis as they're coming in for a contract or for a, a time frame dedicated as needed for these, these issues that are coming up Granted, there's nothing on the slate right now, but there's a lot of work that Planning Commission put forth that all of a sudden got stalled because it was going to cost us $135 an hour in lieu right. of that $55 yeah. or $50 that it was. And so I'd rather see us maybe going a direction more towards a solid planner here and, and being able to have those issues be addressed. Yeah, and, and, and that may be a discussion in the budget process. Well, what do you mean by a solid planner? <coughs> so it's, it, toward, when you had John Morgan here, he was, he was here addressing issues every time in, in lieu where you have the firm that's now where they were a solid, solid planner in the sense they're, they're doing a good job, but it's somebody made the decision to flip the coin whether they're going to spend the money on the planner or not or have staff try to do the research. And staff right now, we don't have a deputy city recorder that did a lot of that that's research that was out there. And, and I think that the difference between the, what Jeff's talking about is <coughs> You know, having a planner who you know works regular hours I mean, okay. and, and is, is under contract versus that would be a, I think a more of an RFP request for a proposal for a contract versus uh, a planning service firm that then just that, that is available as needed and has and has a fee for their for their hours. I think that's the difference, and I, I'm just curious what. I mean, you mentioned the budget process, but I'm just curious what your perspective in the, in the history of, you know, hotels you work at, um, for our world communities, is it, is it, uh, is there a benefit to having a, a contracted person who works regular hours, or is there a benefit to having just a kind of an ad hoc as needed? Now, Kathy, you disagree with me if you feel so, but I think there was a distinct advantage for you to have a deputy recorder who provided that in-house capability. And what, what I'm suggesting you begin to look for is maybe contracting for some firm who has that small rural sensitivity for a year or two so we could handle proposals that come in uh, might lead you uh, to where you need to have a different staffing pattern in the recorder's office because if you do things right here, you should have more economic development and you're going to have more of a need and we could create a fee structure that would support that position in-house. Kathy, what do you think? You're the, you're the one who takes, you know, carries those on your shoulders right now. Most of the time, someone coming in for a land use issue, they pay a fee and their fee would hopefully cover the planner. 
our fee schedule at the time was per the previous planner's fee. Now we can't raise those fees, so I don't even know if we depending on what we're going to get a new planner for, we could be in some trouble there. But there are those things, as Jeff was talking about, our code is very difficult to interpret. Uh, many cases I could tell you about where, yes, the deputy recorder spent her time researching, but in the position we're at now with the planner at $135 an hour, we can't even call him to say, we have a question about a piece of property. We're looking at the code and we're saying, we think this is what it means, but we want a professional opinion because we know there's gonna be flack. We do need a person, a professional person, that we can call and say, this is our code. You know, yes, we've spent 16 hours and this is what we think this person needs to do, or do you agree? And it could take them three or four hours to say, mm -hmm. yes, I agree, or no, let's do this. And right now, we don't have the money or the person to go to. Right. And we have had issues. The court, for instance, we've had people <coughs> call and say, we'd like to do this, we need to do this, and we're sitting here and really not being able to operate at all. So we need, we actually do need a, a professional person that we can go to and and then there's time for the research if we don't have a professional person to go to. Yeah. Well, So that would drive you back to whatever that number is. Is it 45 an hour? I believe it was 45 in-house and it was actually 65 uh, development outside. So city stuff you get for 45 an hour. Right, yeah. So we get RFQ using that scale. Yeah, but there's some sure. algorithm. Sure, sure. Right. The developer pays them. The person who has a <coughs> has a <coughs> excuse me has a proposed development or a project. That cost is paid by them, not by the city. We that's have, we have that's a not form. an increase in their fee. Well, we have a form that they sign that says, along with our fee schedule, it says you get two hours for this particular deal. Okay. But then we have a piece of paper that says if it goes beyond the two hours, you don't have your stuff together. You know we can charge what it actually costs us, and they sign it, and, and so we've had to do that many times. So some of it is covered. Yeah. If some we of pay, it would be covered. If we pay 200 mm -hmm. an hour, some of it's covered. I mean, that, that would be an example. And the way we've worked with Larry also before is, this is how much money we got, <coughs> especially in the last year. <coughs> we have X amount of dollars paid for this application, and we need you to do this within this amount of money. And he has a great to do that. Yeah. So that that's worked for us too. Yeah, I, I just don't want to minimize that because <coughs> it's not development when you think of big corporations or builders. You know, for example, I went through the process uh, to put a shop on my property mm -hmm. and as a citizen. Don't want to be too cavalier about saying 
Exactly. So I think the question there is, do you want to move forward? Do you want to see some other iterations of this approach? How do you want to proceed? Yeah, and I think the, I, I, I think the deal has raised an issue that we ought to, we ought to weigh in on, and that is, um, should we be capping it at what our current fees um, are capped at and run the risk that no one replies to the request for quote? Or should we stick with the uh, Paul suggestion that uh, we just list it as uh, not, to, not to exceed it? So what I'll do is get with Kathy, we'll uh, recraft this uh, showing no dollar amount cap in it, and it'll come back in a few, probably a month, Kathy, would you, I can't remember what we have it scheduled for, but it'll come back for a formal action in about a month. Well, just to say, just to follow through on this, obviously <coughs> it is being put out that this is for more community, community right? yeah. that's cats so Yeah. They know, they know who they're trying to get to work with. So. Yeah. Big Lake Oswego firm comes in. Yeah. They don't meet that qualification. Yeah, they know it. You, I, th I think, uh, uh, at least what I've seen here in the, in the three months that I've been here is that, <clears throat> and I can tell you this from other small rural communities, development is different here. If you want development and you want stronger businesses, it is a different approach than if you're sitting in Tigard or Tualatin. It's totally different. And the same rules and the same procedures and the same strictness are not necessarily in your best interest. Having that flexibility and the ability to see what it is you're trying to accomplish is extremely important, regardless of the price and who pays for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, and then we'll move on to our last uh, report of the night, and that's uh, Mr. Cook's uh, report. Gosh, I was hoping to keep Gail here till midnight, but I don't think I'm going to do it. <laughs> so what you have in front of you is uh, my uh, interim report for November 28th. A couple things that I need to highlight for you. Tomorrow at 11.30, and I mentioned this in my uh, weekly status report that you received, the State of Oregon Regional Solutions Team is going to be out at the port at 11.30. I've taken the uh, opportunity to order three lunches so that if you want to attend, you should do so. We should have 
somebody from the council there. The meeting starts at 11.30. It probably will go for two hours and includes a lunch. That meeting will focus on, and if you look at the attachment to my staff report, uh, Chuck Daughtry from the port and I have put together this list. Now you've seen this before, uh, but this is a list of some projects and some ideas that we think would be beneficial. If the state's going to roll up their sleeves and help us do some things. Here are some areas where they think, we think they, they could be most helpful. Clearly the Nestle Waters is the number one economic development opportunity that you have. That ought to be very high for all of us. But the railroad at grade crossing, uh, improvements to ODOT's frontage road, uh, the truck length restrictions uh, in downtown. So there's a whole laundry list of ideas there uh, that came in out of in part of our work with the Joint Economic Development Task Force and some other ideas that Chuck and I developed by sitting back and saying, if we're not going to get some big projects, what are some things that we ought to be looking at trying to get? Nobody has adopted or approved this list yet, but at least we'll be able to give it to the state and say, if you're looking for projects, we've got plenty and we need lots of help. Uh, second is the Community Action Team. That is a organization that's been in existence for about 15 years. Uh, it would be good to have city, one of the city council members make a commitment to attend that monthly meeting. The next meeting will be on December 8th. On December 5th, in this room, we're going to have about 3,207 people in here working on creating the vision for downtown. So uh, for some of you, uh, were any of you at the downtown meeting we had about two weeks ago at the Charburger? Can't remember. So we had about 30 people, uh, mostly downtown business <coughs> folks, sitting with us trying to make the commitment to really do something in the downtown area. As a small rural community, we have few economic development opportunities. Clearly, Nestle is one. Strengthening our existing um, downtown area, downtown revitalization is one of the places that we can go to to strengthen the local economy. There are other projects, but they may be more long term. So there is a lot of interest. The Tourism Committee and the, the fledgling group that we have not organized yet for downtown revitalization are going to meet here on the 5th and we're going to spend some time looking at the existing, is it 2004, Kathy, was that the downtown plan? 2005, 2000, <coughs> 2001, I thought. Was it that? There is an approved city downtown plan. Now we're trying to breathe some life into that, create a downtown association to work with us to start make some of this stuff happen. Uh, we talked uh, at, the la at the last work session about the broadband bill billing, and I just wanted to remind you that as of December 1st, we will start billing council members who want to stay in that system. It's $40 a month. I talked with FEMA again this morning. Uh, we're continuing to do a transition of the management of the three or four FEMA grants that you have to existing city staff and trying to manage those things to completion and they're more than happy uh, to work with us on that. Uh, Chuck and I, the mayor and the chairman of the Port Commission have talked about a possible joint meeting between the city council and the Port Board. Uh, the mayor and I will be meeting with uh, Chuck and the chairman of the port board in, in the next week or so. But at some point, I think it's real critical for this group to meet with that group and begin coming closer together. Yes, we have the Joint uh, Economic Development Task Force. Uh, we've reprogrammed that meeting to show up at nighttime to make it easier for all of you to participate. And those meetings will be posted so that we don't run into any problem with uh, having meetings that aren't noticed. Um, and then um, the, the attorney and I have been talking with OMI 
And so in a couple weeks, we should have the proposed contract, uh, five-year contract for OMI to operate the sewer treatment plant. That's, that is all I have for tonight. I tried, Gail, but I just couldn't. I don't, I don't. Let me do a couple of things here. Um, so, so going back to, uh, there's a request that at least one council member attend uh, tomorrow's meeting at 11.30 a.m. Uh, that's the State Regional Solutions Team meeting. Who's available to do that? Tom? Mark? Yeah? I, I may be. Super. Who was it? Tom? This one big lunch. <laughs> How about three small ones? <laughs> I bring, bring three of our girls. Go. <laughs> so okay. don't, don't worry about the lunches. J just show up. And I th I th this, is a, this is a good opportunity for elected officials to interface with state agency folks to help solve local problems. And they are being charged by the governor with coming up with projects that are going to help small communities. Okay, then the community action team meeting on uh, December. I, I didn't catch the time for that. It, it is a daytime meeting, and I can get that to anybody who's interested. I Probably thought it was at 10. I'm going to say around 10. Okay. Um, so, is it noon? It's at noon. Um, so, is there anyone able to attend that meeting? Uh, we can always check in later. If you need to check it. Yeah. This time of year, I've, I've got some. I've got time off where I can. Once summer comes, I'm. There is no time. Right. But this time of year, I, I, I'll try to get as many meetings as I can get to this time of year. Okay. What, what day is that? What's uh, I know the day, but the day. What's the day? Thursday. 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 Yeah. December 5, downtown revitalization. Uh, it is a uh, port meeting. The port has noticed that it's, it's going to notice it as a port meeting. The city council is noticing it as a city council meeting. Isn't that the joint meeting that you're talking about later on? If, we're, if both groups are, are there. Well, the focus of the December 5th meeting is, is the vision for downtown. Sure. The, the idea of getting the council together with the port board would be a separate meeting where you begin to talk about how do we work better together, what do we need to be working on, what are our priorities. Right, and I guess the way I'm looking at it is economic development is where the city and the port meet. And that's, that's the one thing we do work on together. Right. Just by the nature of our... our board. So um, I, I look at that as the, as the joint meeting and then when we need to start talking about things like how do we work better together at a different meeting, maybe that's possible, but to me every, every time we have a joint meeting, economic development is the main agenda item. Because that's where the two that's where the two boards intersect. So I I approached December five as a joint meeting of the of, of our two boards. Well, you, but you aren't going to have that discussion between the two boards to begin coming closer together. What you will do is you'll both open your meetings and then we're going right to a review of the existing downtown plan and then right to the newsprint to begin hammering out a vision. So there's, not, there's, there's no framework there for having that broader discussion about what can the city and the port do together to create jobs and economic development. Other than the downtown revival. Exactly, exactly. Is, right. To me, yes. that, there's your agenda yes. item for that joint meeting. Yeah. And when, when we have con further meetings of the, the task force as a, as a joint court council meeting, then, you know, some of those other items might make their way onto the agenda. But at this point, it's economic development specific to downtown revival. 
Right. right. Yes. No, I, I mean, I think that's a, a positive step that we're taking. So that's it for the reports and presentations, which takes us. Oh, did you have another comment on that? Well, yeah, I did. Well, Sorry. A question or a suggestion or something. But under the uh, OMI contract. Yes. And you're going to be working with them to develop an updated contract? That's correct. In the new contract, and it may be at the current contract, but there, there should be a scope of services that they provide. Right. I mean, I'm just going back to the conversation yes. we had about well, what all do they do? And yes. You know, falling all over, all over you know, trying to, you know, grasp at different actions. Right. And I, I would assume there would be a scope of services that liberalize some of those in the contract. Right. And okay. we're and we're going to be pushing for more clarity and the scope yeah. of services, and we're going to be pushing for some cost identifications for each okay. of those right. is where we're at right now. We don't know other than 89,000. We don't know anything more than you pay 89,000 for what we don't know. Oh, so it's not in the current contract is what they do. There's, a laun there's a laundry list of things that you get, but we have no idea what they cost. Okay. And, the, and we have no way of m measuring that without the cost and without some parameters on that. We don't know if they're complying or not. We guess that they are, but we think there ought to be some, for that amount, there ought to be some improvement in the level of service. Okay. So what we're talking about then is getting a differentiation of uh, the, the services that they provide and what those costs are right. as a breakdown part of the, the contract. Okay. In, in fact, Dave and I are talking about maybe building in a section so that I at the end of three years, there's a meeting between the city and OMI to talk about how's this going, what is the cost, is if you want to position yourself at some point to take over the operation, you need to know more than we know now. And so if we have that, maybe there's an opt-out period. the state of Oregon. <coughs> if, if you're, if you're going to miss out on a few million from a casino, maybe the state ought to pay you something for it. These, these things you have, these have value. You can't walk away from 1,700 jobs <coughs> and not have anything. Thanks for asking. Does this mean we can push well, Gail till midnight? Uh, well, it depends on how many dots you're going to Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, could you just restate where we, where we were in that process? And I think we had a, <coughs> we were looking at the idea of working with a group. Yeah, I thought there was general consensus to look at the council priorities in their grouped format, and then trying to figure out how to maybe adjust or develop priorities underneath each of those, and you may want to set priorities for each of the seven broad categories. Is that where we're at, Council? The way I, I, I think so. I think the way, the way I would approach it is the first step is to look at the seven main categories and agree on uh, prioritization of those. And we've got some numbers 
members there to tell us what the previous council action was on those priorities. And then from there, we look at each each subcategory, <coughs> each each item underneath, and then prioritize those. Does that make sense? Is there any objection to proceeding that way? Okay, so, so I don't think so. I think that the first step is just to is to go through and, and look at ideas of within these seven categories. Does everyone have a list of this? Tom, do you have a, a list of this? I, I don't. Is that right? Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so the number one priority before was resolved issues surrounding the, the current conflict in the fire department. Is there anyone who thinks that should still be our number one priority? Okay, so we'll keep that as number one. Um, the next was finance as a priority. Uh, is there anyone that uh, suggests that that would, would not be the second priority? Do you want to talk to that, Jeff? Yeah. Finance down one, if not two. I understand the importance of it, but I think there's some other uh, glaring issues that we need to address. And when we come to the other other ones, I'll, I'll kind of chime in on that. But I think you'd probably switch two and three around. So you're talking about keeping economic development as the second priority and then finance being the third priority? Yes. Okay. Is there anyone that disagrees with that idea? Okay. Gail, did you want to speak to that? No, I just disagree. I just do like economy. <laughs> I just think that managing the city's finances uh, has got real disruptive, you know, you know, hence the previous council and budget process. And with the new council, I don't think we're fluent in where we're at in the current budget. We know we're short of funds. I think it's been mentioned, you know, probably the need to get new funds been discussion about the need probably to go out on ballot measures for uh, fees and, and rate increases if we need to. And I think that fire and ambulance is going to be a while before it can pay for itself. And there may be a need to go out on a ballot measure to, or make our choices between those two uh, for, for looking at subsidizing Right. You know, and prior to that, we've got to have and define and educate the community and several kind of things. So I, I won't go on and on. I just think it's I, I think I got to stay high for it. Okay. And just to clarify, so everyone clear, uh, included in resolving issues around the fire department is <coughs> determine how to fund and operate the department, which is, we've identified that as number one. Maybe that's not included in the finance. In fact, it isn't included in the right. finance. But there's, okay. there's always interconnection. Yeah, and Mayor, if I could jump in yeah. here, that, uh, and I think, Gail, you're, you're absolutely correct, and that's why I packaged the recommendation about the task force. If, we c if you could get to the point where you can um, get some of the citizens to work with you on this and do a couple of community meetings, Within 90 days, it, those 90 days are going to fall due within the budget process, as Mary Ann and I are going to be recommending it to you. And so that will give you time to look at that as maybe the first prototype for something that you then consider going out for. I'm fine with it. So. Well, I, I would agree with Gail on that. And the finances are, are an issue, and, but I'm, I'm not in total agreement with how, you know, how it was created. It's not like created from last council, but I believe it was created from the council before that who, in my opinion, ignored the, um, 
financial issues we were in. The last, this last council um, went after those financial issues and did the best they could with limited resources to get the city to pay its bills and balance its budgets and, and, and stay, with, stay within its means. So um, yeah, I, I, I believe there are some, there are some serious um, financial issues in here that we do have to deal with. And if we want to go back and look at the, the budget, let's look at the budget, but yeah, there's, but I wouldn't say it was the last council person. I'd say it was the council prior to that, and, and prior to that, it left, let things get way, way out of hand on us financially. I'll correct my statement. It's been years of accumulating, accumulating yeah. problems economic development until you know where you're at financially. That's, um, maybe it's a chicken and the egg type thing, but, but um, everything we're wanting to do down here economically or getting with the board or doing anything has to do with doing something with money. And um, you know, until, until we really know where we're at financially, it doesn't seem like we can really act or, or work because all these things down here, we're going to make, we're going to make financial decisions. And I just, believe that if you, if you know where you're at financially, it's going to be easier for you to, easier for you to, to make a financial decision. Because I think, listen to the Gale, I believe he wants to get into the budget and move, and move some things around and, and, and in order to potentially do some of these things, I, I suppose. Yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. Just, I'll tell you this one last comment. <coughs> That's correct. And yet we don't know what our rate structure would be. So if they were to ask us today, you know, how, how what our electrical rates were going to be, can we tell them? You cannot without that study. Bingo. And and I just want to point out though that that rate study isn't anywhere in our So I, I would just like to review it. Fees and charges and assume that as part of it. I, I pushed it under. That's not, that's not the, the yeah. electrical rate. Yeah. But oh. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's, okay. I, I would just like to say, though, that, that I don't think anyone is suggesting that um, finance is not important if we list economic development as a higher priority. To me, those are two parallel tracks, and we have to, we, there's no option about whether we work on one and exclude the other. There, there's no way that we can say, we're just gonna let fight everything on the finance list go and not get to it because we gotta work our way down uh, the economic development list. And for, for me, I think when we, you know, our, our job as, as city council is to set a vision for the community. And when I look at this list of bring Nestle to town, retain a local, School, closer working relationship with the port, uh, revitalize downtown. I think those are the kinds of things that, when you have a vision for the, the, the 
future of the community, those are the kind of things you want to be working on. That really is the, the role of the council. When we get into some of the more detailed, um, how we're going to do audits and things, um, that's important. We have to we have to oversee that. But as far as setting a, a course for the for the future of the community, economic development is where is where it's at. We have to do. We want to do all of these things. But but the way I look at it is, economic development is an investment in the future so that we can have uh, improved finances. We have we have to bring, we have to have the local school. We have to have jobs here. Now, we, we have to revitalize our downtown so that we are on a more sound financial uh, footing. So uh, I agree with Jeff that economic development should be flip-flopped with finance, recognizing though they're both very close. They're both, both high priorities uh, that we have to get to. So that, that's where I stand on it. Randy? No, I was just saying, I, I, I agree that they're both on equal footing. Whether you list one over the other, it's I'm neutral with that as well. I don't care either. Are you okay with having a uh, 2A and 2B? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to go back to, to Gail's comment. The review and update the electric fees and Tier 2 rates is in the enhanced infrastructure listing. It's item G. <coughs> And you've already, you've already given us direction to move forward, so we'll be in front of you in January with a proposal to go out for proposals for that. Can you make a note of finance with that first step? I can. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty far down. That has no, yeah, that has no votes. Well, and I, I think it's important for the financial picture. Yeah. And to the economic development picture. Yeah, I, and I, I support the economic Everybody's been trying for years to create economic development. We're faced with financial crises every year, no matter what happens with economic development. So I totally support Nestle that's a tangible, you know, another pie in the sky venture. But I'm concerned about our financial solvency because we get faced with that every year. Isn't it pie in the sky? I'm sure there's a yeah, pie sure. Well, and I think this is, Gail raises an important point here. All of these things need to be done. You're going to, you have to do your electric rate study and your tier two study if you're going to get, if you're going to have a hope of having any economic development. That needs to be done. And whether it's in the in infrastructure list or in finance or economic development, isn't going to change the relative importance of that particular issue. It wouldn't change the timing of it? Okay. Okay. Two number twos. Moving on to number four. Um, listed here on, on this group priority list is communicate and rebuild community trust. Uh, we'll list uh, seven priorities there. Is there any objection to having that one um, next after finance and economic development? As opposed to the other two. Okay. Well, I think we need to do that to find out what the community is willing to support and what, they, what, what their uh, what their interest is to keep us focused. So any community vision and your community engagement, I think, is, is only going to pay off in all the other areas. Yeah. Sure. I, I agree. You know, I don't want to fall into the trap that happened in the past where we talked about having a town hall meeting, but nothing gets scheduled. So, you know, I don't care if it's January, February, March, April, May, or June. But I think we ought to put a, a placeholder somewhere on the calendar so the community knows in advance where, where, the, where the focal point is, if you suggest it. We can always change the schedule later if it doesn't happen or something, but we do a lot of talking and not position. And, and as I said earlier, I think when we 
create the task force, whether it has, you know, your five or his 15 or whatever it is, I think at that point, that's the time to set those down. So, Gail, you and I could be there. What the heck? <laughs> okay. Um, so, I'm not hearing any objection to that being the, the next item. Um, enhance infrastructure following as the next priority. Uh, any objection to that? Not hearing any. So, hire a new city administrator being the next. I'll jump in on that. To me, I don't. I mean, I said this when we when we first started, um, right to left. I don't. I don't see that it needs to be. It's, it's just assumed that's what you're going to do. That's that's a process, and I don't believe that you're. If I just think we need to take it off, and we need to, you know, we just have. That's one of your tasks, but it's not part of our council priorities. Right, and I do intend to be here in January with a proposal for you on that. Right. Well, I just got to ask. We have a contract with you for a year, right? Until August 30th of 2012. What happens then? Well, if, we do, if I do my work right and deal with the council priorities, you have a new city administrator here sometime in June. We have a transition period. Why, why don't we just extend your contract if we decide we like you? Well, you may decide that you don't. That, so a part of the, this is a good this is a good question. Part of being an effective interim for you is to ha is to know that that drop dead date is there because we will do things that you might not ordinarily do because you know that I'm only going to be here for a certain period of time. I'm not invested here for two years, five years, or twenty years. We had a certain amount of time to get certain things done. Okay, but just a point of clarification, are you, is the August date because you don't want to be here anymore, or was that just the date that was picked? That is the date that was negotiated and picked and approved by the council. Okay, so, so realizing August is a long ways off, if we decided to extend your agreement because we like you, you would entertain that idea even though we have a plan to replace the city administrator? When we get closer to that date, if you want to have that discussion, I would entertain the discussion. Okay. I'm not committing that I would be here because if I did, <coughs> you might see a different product. No, I understand. I'm just trying, I, I wasn't here for the original agreement. I didn't understand more what led to the boundary. Yeah, that, that's that's why. I, I think the other the other thing to look at there too, though, which kind of ties in with what Paul's saying, is that um, you know we may go through a hiring process and as we did in the last you know this this past <coughs> summer and we may not end up with the person that, that we want to hire sure you know and then that that raises the same question you're raising so, maybe you know hit, hit my question right on the head about the timeline so okay. well thank you so i think where the rubber hits the road is this is a good example i'm 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 not sure we would have done in the fire department what we did if my goal was to be here until I retire. Okay, that's good. That's fine. But because the council set that as the number one priority and set the parameters of what I was to do, and because I'm only going to be here till August 30th or until something else happens, I don't know. Ralph, is something going to happen? I don't know. You, so the, the point is... Just keep looking at Gail, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that's, and that had just happens to be my personal philosophy. You hired me to do a job. Yeah. A lot of what I have to do is going to be to tell you stuff you don't want to hear and make you do things you don't want to do. But if I'm here as a 
as a long time person, I might not right. do those things. Well, I'm usually drawing what I don't think. Well, I know. I hear it all the time from Mary Ann anyway, but. <laughs> so then we can remove six off this list then? That's what I proposed. Yeah. I guess we're going to be working with finance, let's just be able to say that. Oh, okay. 